right, Denny, thank you very much. And Showdown Saturday continues on ESPN. It's been a rainy evening in the Bayou State, but they're excited at Tiger Stadium in Baton Rouge as the defending national champions come to town to take on the Fighting Tigers of LSU. Good evening, I'm Bob Carpenter, and welcome to Baton Rouge. Interesting outing for both of these clubs here tonight. Miami didn't get any help today as Notre Dame and USC both stayed unbeaten, so the Hurricanes can only keep on winning and hope they get a little bit of help down the stretch in their quest for another national championship. Meanwhile, LSU has to win a non-conference game here tonight to take a big step toward their conference's bowl game. The SEC champions are hopefully headed for the Sugar Bowl. And it was a couple of dates in October as we look back on the 88 season that were important to both these teams. When fourth-ranked Auburn came to Baton Rouge, LSU was licking the wounds of a two-game losing streak. And for three and a half quarters, the pain was only getting worse. But as time ran down, they got what they desperately needed, one last chance. LSU wins or loses on this play, it would appear. Touchdown! October 8th, one game, one win, one season made. October 15th, South Bend, Indiana, stop number five on the Hurricane Tour to the national title. Miami had the talent, the flair, and the number one ranking, but somehow it backfired. Despite a record performance by Steve Walsh, the Canes fell short. And for the first time in 16 games, Jimmy Johnson got a taste of defeat. Losing has never been on the Miami menu, just championships. Now they'll need a little help and a string of wins just to have a chance at number one. So right now, Kevin Kiley, the Hurricanes are not number one, but you know, and a lot of folks around the country think this team is the best in our land. You know, for a place called Death Valley, there's a lot of life in this place, isn't there? They're screaming like the devil out there. Miami, yeah. You know, Lou Holtz, coach of Notre Dame, after they beat Miami, called them the number one team in the nation after he won the game. It's a team that's won for a long time, and they've done it with quarterbacks, some pretty good quarterbacks. Steve Walsh may not be the best athlete ever to play that position for Miami, but before he's done, he may be the best quarterback. Let's look at last year, the skill positions for Miami. All of the guys besides Walsh are gone to the NFL. Walsh was the only player coming back at the skill position, and he has made this team a contender again for the national title. Incredible performance, great depth all the way through. And a couple of moments ago, the folks saw the clip of the touchdown pass of Tom Hodson to Eddie Fuller to beat Auburn. But as in many cases this year, Kev, it was the LSU defense that put them in that position well, to win. That's the unit, Bobby. You're right. Uh, Hodson was a Heisman candidate. He will not win it this year. Make no mistake about it. LSU is a defensive team. It's a team that gives up a lot of first downs, but not a whole lot of points. In the huddle, they say to each other, we'll stop them in a minute. They'll stretch, but they will not break. They have excellent outside linebacking in Eric Hill and Ron Sancho, and they have to be the difference tonight against Miami. They've got to keep the Hurricanes from making the big play, make them work long and hard to score here tonight. Working down on the sidelines, here's Chris Fowler. All right, Bob, folks, Death Valley is alive tonight. These fans can make this the toughest place for a visiting team in all of college football. On the other hand, Miami is the best road team. They've won 23 of the last 25. However, this year, in big games on the road, they've struggled just a little bit. You know about the close win over Michigan and the one-point loss in Notre Dame. They had a lot of turnovers and gave up a lot of points in both games. The LSU fans will do their best to be a factor tonight. We've got a decibel meter to keep track of just how loud things get down here. Bob? Chris, I hope you can hear us at the end of the night better than we can hear you right now. And here come the Hurricanes of Miami. from LSU take the field. ESPN Showdown Saturday, Miami and LSU is being brought to you by AT&T, the right choice. By the good times, great taste of McDonald's. And by Wang Laboratories. Wang makes it work.
Okay, we've told you about the repercussions of the Hodson to Fuller touchdown pass versus Auburn. Well, across campus here at the Geology Building, repercussions were felt in a different way. Now, this is a seismograph machine used to measure vibrations from earthquakes all over the world. And on October 8th, exactly at 9.32 p.m., this blob of ink appeared. Now, that represents, professors say, fans jumping up and down in Tiger Stadium after Fuller scored that touchdown, the play that shook the earth. Fellas, they have hurricanes in Miami, but here in Baton Rouge, they have occasional earthquakes. All right, Chris, there's been a hurricane watch on throughout the week here. And now there may be even some tornado activity in the area tonight. Skies are overcast. It's rather warm and rather muggy. Winds from the east, a chance of rain 80%. We've already had some heavy rains here at Tiger Stadium this evening, starting at about 545 Central Time earlier this evening. Jimmy Johnson, his fifth year at Miami, he is 48-9 after five pretty good years at Oklahoma State. But he is one of the powerful coaches in the nation right now. And on the other side, Mike Archer, youngest coach at this stage in college football. He is 17-3-1 in his second year here at LSU. The kicker is number one for Miami, Edgar Bennis, the junior out of Miami Beach. He does not do the place kicking, but he does the kickoff. Vincent Fuller is number 27. He's up there on the goal line, along with number two, Slip Watkins, as we get ready for an exciting night here at Tiger Stadium in Baton Rouge. the end zone that one goes as Watkins let it go by and let's meet the Tigers offensively LSU fans have had high expectations lately for junior quarterback Tom Hudson juniors Victor Jones the fullback Calvin Windham a tailback Eddie Fuller is injured dangerous juniors Alvin Lee and Tony Moss the wide receivers Lonnie Halliburton from Jimmy Johnson's hometown the tight end senior Todd Couty is the center the guards are juniors Ruffin Rodriguez and Jim Hubix LSU's best left tackle Ralph Norwood, Robert Packnett on the right side. One back is Victor Jones. Back to the line of scrimmage, maybe another foot or two. Maurice Crum on the tackle. The Hurricanes defensively. Quick Russell Maryland and Jimmy Jones are the tackles. Greg Mark at left end with All-American Bill Hawkins on the right side. He's Miami's number one sack man. All-American Rod Carter starts in middle linebacker with Randy Shannon at strong side. Quick sophomore Maurice Crum on the weak side. Seniors Donald Ellis and Bubba McDowell at the corners. Bobby Harden and freshman Charles Farms are the safeties. On second and ten. Alvin Windham, a junior tailback. Boy, the depth chart of tailback all messed up, Kevin, for this team. Of course, Harvey Williams injured since last year. He's out of the picture. And now Eddie Fuller is out as well. Uh, Fuller's a big loss, and Calvin Windham was fourth on the depth chart until recently, but he had a big game last week. Ran for almost 100 yards, about 85 yards. So, And he's a good receiver, but they are not a running team. LSU will use the pass to set up the run. Darrell Williams is the lone back behind Hudson. Just over the outstretched hands of Calvin Windham. So LSU on the first drive, failing to get a first down. Hudson under fire lately from these sometime fickle but very loyal LSU fans. And on the kick, it will be Rene Bourgeois, the walk-on junior, averaging better than 42 a kick. Back at his own 40 is Daryl Spencer, a freshman wide receiver. He averages a little over eight per return. Hurricanes were coming, no return set up here. And a short kick squibs dead at the 46, maybe the 45. Let's meet the Hurricanes. Quarterback Steve Walsh, a junior, now in the top five, all-time passing at the U of M. Senior Cleveland Gary, the fullback, Miami's number one receiver, the halfback, Leonard Connolly. Speedy receiver, sophomore Randall Hill and senior Andre Brown with eight touchdowns with five in his last three games, tight end Randy Bethel. The center is the cat, Bobby Garcia. Sophomores, Mike Sullivan and Darren Handy are the guards. Seniors, Darren Bruce and Miami's best up front, John O'Neill, are the tackles. Outstanding field position for this dangerous offense. Leonard 
Conley. About a five-yard loss as Clint James got him from right in. The LSU defense, senior nose guard Daryl Phillips anchors one of the nation's toughest. Juniors Carl Dunbar and Clint James, a defensive end. The linebackers inside, seniors Rudy Harmon and Eric Hill. Outside, four-year starter Ron Sancho with Mike Abair. Jimmy Young and Mike Mays, the corners. The strong safety, Jamie Bice. Greg Jackson, LSU's best in the secondary, on the weak side. Walsh right up the middle inside the 40 for Leonard Conley. The halfback catching his 19th of the year. Jamie Bice on the stop on a 20-yard game. Well, that's a main concern for LSU against this Miami team is going to be those inside passing routes out of the backfield. And so they've moved Eric Hill, normally an outside linebacker, into the inside to try and help cover on pass. It didn't, it didn't help him there. First down for Miami inside the 40. Leonard Conley up the middle, then angling to his left. Eric Hill, that inside linebacker. Mike Mays from right corner on the tackle. There's a nine-yard gain on the ground on first down. Well, there's a shot of Hill, number 54. He's replaced Osbury. The reason, simply he's a better athlete, and they're very, very concerned about the underneath pass coverage. The top 12 receivers for Miami are averaging over 10 yards a catch. Top 12 on their chart. Pretty easy pass on second and two. Randall Hill, a sophomore out of Miami, who's caught 16 passes, now make it 17, averaging 14 a catch. Bear and Mays on the stop. And the next time Steve Walsh throws a touchdown pass, it'll be a new Miami single season record. He has 26 on the year. him up Mike a bear Gary averaging four plus per carry 13 per catch Kevin they've got a back who's leading the team in receiving this year and a big back 6 2 226 tremendous athlete what you see there is his rushing yardage what you don't see is his 44 receptions and this is a team really that's run by the quarterback he finds people he spreads them out and Gary's been the recipient of that to the deep man Leonard Conley nowhere to go because of Carl Dunbar the strength of this LSU defense may be those three down people and Dunbar number 63 will close quickly Conley's a little guy 170 pounds I told you in the open it's the type of defense that will give up first downs but they're extremely tough when you get close to the goal line it was second and five make it third and six It is, and Miami has it for the touchdown as Randall Hill falls on it. Steve Walsh with all kinds of time to throw. Gary, the reception, the drop, and Hill, the touchdown. And that's a record-setting throw for Steve Walsh. And he can give part of the credit to his offensive line. They did a tremendous job. He had all day that close to the goal line. That's devastating to a defense. He's been picked off nine times, so three times as many touchdown passes. Carlos Huerta, perfect in 33, make it 34 straight, and Miami takes 422 to get on the board. Miami famous for their protection. Dunbar, number 63, double teamed by Handy and O'Neal. He doesn't go anywhere. Walsh had all day to throw the ball. And here comes Gary across the middle. Now remember, Walsh is sitting back there with nothing to do but find him wide open and into the end zone. Miami's offensive line, give it to them. They gave him all day. Randy Harmon on the hit. Randall Hill on the fumble recovery. And Walsh has a new Miami single season record for touchdown throws.
ESPN Showdown Saturday Miami and LSU is being brought to you by Jeep. There's a feeling you can get only in a Jeep. By Tempstar, the newest name in home heating and air conditioning. You can rely on the star. And by Budweiser, Beachwood Age for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. And here in Baton Rouge, this downpour is for you. It is coming down hard as it has intermittently throughout the evening. There was a lot of speculation in the press box on whether that was a touchdown throw or not by Steve Walsh. They have ruled now it is a fumble recovery touchdown. Thus, touchdown pass, the record-setting pass, will have to wait a little bit longer. In the end zone, Slip Watkins will run it out. Not much room on the near side, and he gets out to the 18-yard line. It was a quick Miami scoring drive. Remember, they started at their own 55 and under three minutes, Kev, to go those 55 yards from their own 45. Well, one of the things that Pete Jenkins, the defensive coordinator for LSU, was considering and was really fearing was field position. He didn't want his offense to go three and out. They did. He needed a good punt. They didn't get it. Miami getting the ball at midfield is not going to help LSU. They need to get first down. Slip Watkins, the deep back, feeling his way for yardage. Wrapped up Greg Mark, Rod Carter from middle linebacker, 91 also in there. Slip Watkins, a junior out of Fort Lauderdale. He's one of this stable of tailbacks they have. He goes 5'9", 176. Calvin Windham, who started, is the heaviest of the backs. And we also tonight could see number 27, Vincent Fuller, a freshman who's the younger brother of the injured Eddie Fuller. Good yardage on first down. It'll be second and three. Slip Watkins wrapped up by Greg Mark. Good penetration from left end as Mark number 94 made the stop. And it'll be a third down situation for the Tigers of LSU. Mark is not a very big player, uh, 238 pounds for a down defensive end. When you run away from him, he's very quick, and he can close quickly. That's what he did on that play. That's why he likes defensive end, Kev. He played some tackle. He doesn't like all the hitting that takes place inside. It's too small. <laughs> Hudson with time up the middle, and a good stick there by Rod Carter on Slip Watkins. Well, Slip Watkins, not a very big guy. What he needs to do is run this behind the linebackers. Number one, he would have had a first down had he caught it. He's in front of the sticks. The other reason you run behind the linebackers is because Rod Carter's standing there getting ready to lower the boom on you. Miami says that hits by Carter set the tone early in the game for their defense. Rene Bourgeois for the second time tonight. Looks like good field position again for Miami. Darrell Spencer. And now on a high snap, they'll have to run it. Now they dump it, and it's dropped. And Miami will have the football as LSU has a problem on special teams. Jimmy Johnson's Hurricanes now with a big opportunity to score again very quickly. Miami blocks a lot of kicks. They're very tough on the special teams. There's actually a bad snap. He had no chance to get this thing off, and that's not something you want to do against Miami. He needs to eat the ball and hope the defense can do the job. 23, bad Robert snap. Bailey, the first man in. The pitch to the deep man, Leonard Connolly. Wrapped up there, number 40, the strong safety, Jamie Bice shot the gap and made a nice play on the ball carrier. Now they have told us that that indeed was ruled a touchdown pass. So call it 27 on the year for Steve Walsh, his 46th career in 20 starts, and he's only two away from Vinny Testaverde in that category as well. Cleveland Gary at the 20. Eric Hill from inside linebacker out to get him. Also, you're looking at 
Cleveland Gary, the 6'2 senior out of Indian Town, Florida. He averages 13 per catch. In fact, his catch is 40 plus coming in, a Miami record for a running back. Those were his game starting statistics. Walsh now four for four for 49 yards. Third down, and we'll call it six. A little too tall for Gary. Maybe a bit of an early hit by Jamie Bice, but the ball way too high to be ruled catchable. And a kicking situation for the visiting team. The Tigers didn't want to come with the blitz in this game, but let's face it, they had to do something. Number 54, Eric Hill, from the inside position, doesn't really get all that close, but he makes Walsh get rid of the ball maybe a little early. It's off the mark. LSU's team defense holds. It'll be a 37-yard attempt from Carlos Huerta, a former walk-on. He was cut last year, walked on this year. Twisting to the left, and he got it through, and now he's six for seven on the year between 30 and 39 yards. Almost halfway through the first quarter, Miami early by 10. Well, Jimmy Johnson seems pleased with the way things are going so far. 10 early points, less than halfway through the first quarter. This team's played some tough ones on the road. Edgar Benes will again kick it off. Back to his goal line, Slip Watkins. A big block on that return, and Watkins is out over the 30 to the 33. It's noisy downstairs, but there's Chris Fowler down there somewhere. A lot of noisy and just a little bit wet down here. One of the things you have to think about when you evaluate Miami as a team, their schedule. They have played six teams ranked in this week's top 20 poll. Take a look at the folks they play. Jimmy Johnson says that should be a factor at the end of the year when you make your evaluation for who is the national champ. Uh, Kevin, it's got to be a factor. Uh, it will be a factor. The problem he faces, of course, is that Notre Dame and Southern Cal are both unbeaten and ahead of him in the polls. And unless they tie next week, one of them will still have nothing but W's. The running back, Calvin Wyndham, wrapped up there by Randy Shannon. And to the studio, here's Tim Brando. All right, Bob, from a potential quagmire in the bayou to one in the snow of Pullman, Washington, Tim Rosenbach hands off to Rich Swinton for a one-yard touchdown. Washington State on their way to the Aloha Bowl against Washington. They lead it by two. Aloha. Let's get back to the Bayou. Well, I don't know what we can do to match that. We've got less than seven minutes, first quarter. Victor Jones, the lone setback as Hudson will fling it. Double coverage out there on Tony Moss, and that's something LSU can expect tonight, Kevin. Miami wants to be all over number six. And LSU wants to get the ball to him. What they're trying to do is keep him from being double covered. Number six. I think Tommy Hudson expected the double coverage not to be there, but as you can see, he's covered, but good. Maurice Crum lowering the boom from behind. Now that's the guy they need to get free is Tony Moss. If they can't get him the ball, their offense will be virtually non-existent because they do not run the ball well. coming quickly and Hodson has to dump it. He was looking for his tight end Willie Williams 81 and the Hurricanes have things going their way so far and immediately Kevin folks in Baton Rouge are thinking about their relief pitcher Mickey Gidry the backup quarterback as Hodson struggles early. All right, I'll tell you why now here comes Crum down the pipe on Hodson forces Hodson to throw it away. Remember the team they lost to was a team with a mobile quarterback Tony Rice of Notre Dame and that's what people here are thinking Mickey Gidry is much more mobile than Hodson. And they'll want to see him early if things don't change. Good snap this time and Bourgeois gets it away. End over end. He'll hope for a bounce and gets it about five or six yards worth as the ball dies at the Miami 35 a 34 yard kick and back with more from Baton Rouge in a moment. First quarter it's all Miami so far. time Miami had the football it was deep in LSU territory Tigers got a lift by holding the Canes to only a field goal now Miami at its own 35 play action 
action by Walsh. Right sideline. And a bit of a lack of concentration there by Randall Hill. Has a little tussle with Jimmy Young. But that ball was definitely catchable by the sophomore split end. LSU is going to have to do something. Dunbar, number 63, going nowhere. And Phillips in the middle going nowhere. Now, LSU has got to get some pressure on these guys. James also stopped. They were hoping to get it from the three front guys without blitzing. It's not happening. They're going to have to go to the blitz. Cleveland Gary helping out, blocking at his fullback position. Draw to the deep man, Leonard Conley. Straight ahead he goes. You know, folks earlier said, Kevin, well, Jimmy Johnson has all of Howard Schnellenberger's players. Jimmy, in the last year or two, has done a great job of finding his own. That's been longer than that. You know, they talk about the talent at Miami. Steve Walsh, the quarterback, some say the best quarterback in the country, was recruited by, get this, Northwestern, Louisville, Iowa State, and Miami. Miami was the only, what you would call, major winning program to recruit it. Third and seven as the rain comes down hard. It's set time as Verge Osbury, spelling Eric Hill, the left inside linebacker, makes the stop. Osbury, a 5'11 junior, he slowed a bit with an ankle injury, but he stayed home that time. 5'11, but 224 pounds. They put him back in the middle, and here's the blitz we were talking about. Remember, they can't get it with the front three, so they go with the blitz. They've made an adjustment. Stop Miami. Big stop against Miami here in the first quarter. Tim Kalal is the kicker, averaging 39. Eric Jackson and Jimmy Young back to get it for LSU. To the near sideline, near it. Fair catch by Jimmy Young. With LSU and Auburn currently tied for the SEC lead, we asked Mike Archer about the forthcoming Sugar Bowl decision and who will represent the Southeastern Conference. Uh, the Sugar Bowl has to make a decision. Uh, if we're fortunate enough to beat Miami, we make that decision a little bit tougher if we can beat Tulane the following week. Auburn has to play Alabama yet. Uh, in my heart, uh, and I think in the players' hearts, uh, uh, we deserve to go because we beat Auburn. But again, it's a decision that the Sugar Bowl will make, and we will be very happy to go to New Orleans and represent our conference or go to Tampa and play in the Hall of Fame Bowl. This is Eddie Fuller playing with a hit pointer. But now trying to get the offense started, Coach Archer gets Fuller into the game. Kevin, what about the Southeastern Conference and the decision by the Sugar Bowl on who goes? Some people feel, hey, if you're tied for first and you win the head-to-head -head with Auburn, you've got to be the team that goes. It's a very strange conference because teams do not play each other every single year. It is my opinion, if you have played the team you are tied with and beaten them, you should go. They need to have a clear-cut decision-making process. 1.2 yards per play for LSU so far. 36 is Jay Egloff, the junior fullback. Russell Maryland, the left tackle of Miami. 67, met him head on. It is raining hard as it has intermittently throughout the evening. This is the first time we've had a steady downpour for an extended period of time. Obviously, with almost 80,000 here, it doesn't dampen their enthusiasm too much. Can only help LSU. The team with superior personnel, with more precision, and you'd have to give that to the Miami offense, will suffer in the rain. Tigers are all for three on third down. Pulled down beautifully by Eddie Fuller. Remember him from our game opening video? He caught the touchdown pass from that young man, Tommy Hudson, to beat Auburn. Big matchup in this game, Ralph Norwood. He is the best offensive lineman for LSU, and he's working against Bill Hawkins, the All-American, and doing a job on him. A little strangle hole there from Ralph. <laughs> and Eddie Fuller playing hurt. You may remember from the Auburn game, he's the one who caught it in the back of the end zone. Not unlike this catch with a hip pointer. That's a tough catch to make, to stretch out and to give up your body. And here's Hudson, who's had his problems, and he knows how big a catch that is. First, first down. Now left side. Slanting in, Tony Moss, an exciting flanker. He's a junior from Bossier City. That's his 44th catch of the year. He's getting near 750 yards on the season. They're looking to him with those numbers, almost 82 yards a game in reception. So the Tigers move the chains twice in a row. Wayne Williams, a freshman in at flanker. Eddie Fuller. Nicely done by Russell. 
Russell Maryland. The number one defensive concern of LSU was Russell Maryland on an individual basis coming in. Husky still on top of the Cougars way up there. Notre Dame staying unbeaten today, as did Southern Cal in the Crosstown rivalry. West Virginia still in the place, man. And it was Back. Nebraska to the Orange Bowl. Michigan to the Rose Bowl. That was a great comeback by Ohio State late. Not enough for John Cooper's team. And a face mask will push the ball further upfield for LSU. And who would believe that Nebraska would get 14 points total in two big games against Colorado and Oklahoma and win both of them? Yeah, you only give up three. Yeah, their defense was their weakness early in the year. They've come around. What a great win for Tom Osborne. Maybe they'll get off his back now. <laughs> On first and five. The ball was up off the arms of Tony Moss. For a moment, Randy Shannon, 22, after the hit by 39, Bobby Harden, had a chance to pick it off, but it squirted away in the air. Well, they just ran this pattern. They're hoping that Fuller will get in the way of the defense. See him? Number 33, bottom of your screen. Moss maybe could have had that difficult pass. If they're going to throw slant into Moss all day, he'll be lucky if he finishes the game. Now he splits out wide to the top of your screen. direction in the backfield Eddie Fuller nothing there as it did not fool the Hurricanes Maurice Crum who Dave Wanstead the defensive coordinator says the best instinctive player on defense he's ever seen just a sophomore out of Tampa and there are some impressive stats for him on the year he was drafted in the 14th round by the Chicago White Sox. They offered him $37,000 to sign. He didn't. He said if they'd have given him 40, he'd have gone. Deion Sanders got 60,000 from George Steinbrenner. And he went. Yes, he did. That's not a bad summer. Hudson with time. And it's overthrown. Alvin Lee, the intended receiver. And a few boos rained down from the stands at Tiger Stadium as Alvin Lee was wide open. Lone coverage, Charles Farms, the freshman number two, is supposed to get over there. Lee, 26, wide open. Maybe these boos are justified. Nobody there. There's Farms, number two, coming late. He had deep coverage on the outside. Hudson missed it. 87 is Brian Griffith, the pooch man, they call him, for LSU. He's the one that places the ball on short kicks down deep. Shanks it off the side of his foot and straight out of bounds. Yeah, it was a pooch, all right, but that one would have only been good from about the Miami 40-yard line. Down to the sidelines, here's Chris Fowler. Okay, Bob, I told you we have the decibel meter to show just how loud it is down here. Now, so far, by far, the loudest reading when LSU ran out on the field, and that registered at 112 decibels. See that how that uh, compares to other loud things? Of course, it's been a little quieter since the Hurricanes have rolled up 10 points, Bob. All right, Chris. Well, we'll get a big LSU scoring play here and see if we can bury that needle. We'll go for the airplane. <laughs> Two minutes remaining, first quarter, as Cleveland Gary is taken down by Ron Sancho. In August of 87, Sancho was quoted as saying, we need a leader on the defensive line. That was prior to his junior season. I'd say he's filled that role the last two years. And he had help on that play from Phillips, the middle guard. Darrell was the guy that got penetration when Gary tried to bounce outside. Sancho was their good team defense. Miami says this may be the best defensive team they've had to face all year. Right down the sideline. And it is good inside the 50 and across midfield as Andre Brown tiptoed the sideline and made a fine play. Brown had 449 yards coming in, an average of 16 yards a catch plus. The thing they say about Walsh is he doesn't have the strength of arm that some of the former quarterbacks, but he's very accurate. You be the judge, pretty accurate. Now that's the same type of pass that Hudson just missed. Here's your accuracy. You can see the thing wobbles, but it gets there. Perfect pass. 22-yard gain as Brown got the feet down. Walsh with a deep drop and Cleveland Gary left side. Well timed on the hit by Jamie Bice, the strong safety. But not enough time to close on Gary before he caught the football. 
match the pass rush. They did a pretty good job. 63, Dunbar trying to get those arms of O'Neal off of him. But as you see, O'Neal very strong, puts him on the ground. What they're trying to do is use kind of a karate pop on the arm, pop that arm up and get rid of the blocker. He did not get it done on that play. Starting his way through is Leonard Conley. That will move the chains as it gets inside the 35. It was second and seven. First down to the Hurricanes. Barry Sanders with almost 300 yards, four scores today for the Cowboys of Oklahoma State. ACC battle won by Clemson. Houston came from behind to win at Lubbock, Iowa, over Minnesota by one at the half. We're in the final 30 seconds of the first quarter in Baton Rouge. Miami 10 with the ball. LSU nothing on a rainy evening. Conley bouncing off a blocker and a tackler. Finally, Eric Hill, who plays behind Mike Abair at right outside linebacker, in on the stop. That is the final play of the first quarter. A touchdown pass and a field goal. Miami 10, LSU nothing. Second quarter gets underway with this snap. Miami on top. It'll be second and six for the Canes. They're at the 30 of LSU and Cleveland Gary is the ball carrier. Still up. He might go. Gary appeared to be stopped near the line of scrimmage and he was gone. Cleveland Gary, leading receiver, but not a bad runner either. There's your contain. No blocker. Sancho misses him, and now he's gone. Osbury caught inside. The secondary not there. Just straight blocking by Miami, and LSU's defense never got to the sideline. And back between the 25 and the 30, Verge Osbury is the man down and injured for LSU. Originally slated this week as a starter, they moved Eric Hill in at left inside linebacker. does not look good. LSU throughout the year had some injuries early in camp. They lost their third corner, which was a big loss to them. Joe Muro went out. They lost Todd Kinchin to tight end, but that all happened in preseason, and they're not a very deep team. They've had, uh, they've been relatively injury-free. This will hurt losing Osborne. They might have to go with Eric Middleton, a 6'2 redshirt freshman who's got a lot of physical talent, not much experience in backing up Eric Hill. So storyline Baton Rouge is all Miami so far. Randall Hill takes a fumble by Cleveland Gary and falls on it for six. Miami in total yards way more than LSU. LSU's kicking game has been, well, awful so far. No problem for Carlos Huerta, 35 straight in his career. And it's Miami 17, LSU nothing. Eight seconds into the second quarter of play. So based on the philosophy that LSU brought into this game defensively, the punting at four punts for an average of 19 yards is the biggest stat. They were trying to get field position. They wanted Miami to have to go a long way offensively. That has not been the case at all. And it's been critical. They have three scores on the board early. The crowd's out of the game, and it's going to be tough on the Tigers coming back. Be sure to join ESPN next Saturday at 11.30 a.m. Eastern for College Game Day. Tim Brando and Vino Cook preview the entire day with a special look at Notre Dame and USC. 7.30 p.m. Eastern, the Battle of Florida. The Gators will take on the fifth-ranked Seminoles of Florida State. And, of course, we've got some Thanksgiving football ahead for you. We'll tell you about that a little bit later. Rain is really coming down hard now. Early second quarter. LSU not nearly the offensive team that Miami is. It'll be tough for the Tigers to generate consistent offense now, the way the field is getting wetter and wetter. Edgar Benes to kick. LSU needs something to ignite them, and that's probably making it to the second quarter. Or this kickoff return. Slip Watkins. Slip the Hurricanes as he gets out too near the 25-yard line. And here comes the relief pitcher. Number 10, Mickey Guidry, 
But you'll often see him come in for a series in the second quarter, even if Hudson is going well, to give Gidry a feel for the game. Now he comes in in a true relief pitcher situation. Well, he's completing 75% of his passes. He has not thrown an interception all year, and he's extremely mobile. A new dimension against the Miami defense. He's had very good luck scoring, and of course, that's what LSU needs to do. In two different games this year, he's completed six out of seven to engineer scoring drives. There's the toss to Slip Watkins, and nothing there as Rod Carter who his teammates don't like to play in practice because he hits hard even then. I used to say that about Dick Butkus. They, they wouldn't let Dick Butkus practice when he was in high school or college because he went around brutalizing his own team. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what Rod does. And as we said earlier, you might remember a hit he had early in the game. A lot of tackles in his career. They say he sets the tone for the Miami defense by hitting people. Gidry with time way out of the reach of Tony Moss. Moss slipped. This is tough, tough assignment for anybody backup quarterback in the rain. And now you see Tony Moss is limping around, and that's not going to help. And back to Carter for uh, for Miami as you look at Moss. Carter broke Tracy Waiter's jaw. Thought he knocked out some teeth. Waiters went to the dentist and found out he had a broken jaw. Here's Tony Moss on the replay. Ground is wet, and he just lost his footing. Yeah, it looked like his right foot planted on the cut, slipped, and then his left foot came right into it. Down he went. Tigers have already lost Verge Osbury on defense, and they cannot afford to lose the explosiveness of Tony Moss, especially the way the weather is changing now. Looks like a lock. Looks like he hyperextended the right knee. Looks like he locked it and then had the pressure coming forward. Actually, wet turf is he, he's not seem to be limping as badly. Here, wet turf is actually better for injuries. In other words, you don't get as many injuries on wet turf because your feet don't lock on the ground. You see an exception there with Moss. Now LSU without Tony Moss facing third and ten. The rain's coming hard, so is the wind. Beyond the reach of Alvin Lee. Kicking time again. Well, Kevin Kylie and I are dry, but Chris Fowler is not. Where are you, partner? Well, Bob, I'm right behind the LSU bench. Virg Osbury, you see him. They are taking him off. You saw him limp off a few plays ago. He has sprained his right ankle. They've got some ice on it. They're taking him to the locker room for an evaluation, Bob. And it's really Really coming down now. We can see it. Rene Bourgeois, the kicker. Miami coming hard, but Bourgeois gets away a wobbly kick that hits at the 43. They'll get a good roll down to the Miami 35 yard line. So we're a minute 11 into the second quarter. Miami by 17 on a wet night in Bayou Country. ESPN Showdown Saturday, Miami and LSU being brought to you by Mazda and the exciting new Mazda cars and trucks for 1989. By the U.S. Army, learn how to get an edge on life, be all you can be. And by Braun Electric Shapers, it is through superior design that superior performance can be achieved. It is a monsoon in Baton Rouge as the Hurricanes go to the offense and to the ground. Shannon Crowell is the ball carrier. He's a 5'11 sophomore who spells Cleveland Gary at fullback. And Kevin Kiley definitely now time for Miami to keep it on the ground a bit. Use that clock. They've got a big lead, especially in these conditions. Well, if we're looking for a silver lining in this particular cloud for LSU, <laughs> trailing 17 to nothing, this may be the best thing that could happen to him. Anything could happen to the football at this point. Gain of three. This is Crowell again. Obviously, the sophomore out of Atlanta, a very intelligent young man who's an architecture major, is good at holding on to the football, so Jimmy Johnson sneaks him into the game at this point. They've called LSU, of course, the dirtiest, the ugliest. I don't mean dirty in terms of dirty play, but the nastiest team ever to win 
the Southeast Conference, and I don't mean nasty in terms of nasty. Ron Sancho, they say he's got an ugly body and he's going to be soaking wet. What I mean by is this is a team that wins ugly by all those words, and this ought to be pretty ugly by the time it gets done raining here. And over the hands of Shannon Crowell, Steve Wallace with plenty of time. One of the end zone markers has blown all the way up to midfield in this heavy wind and rain, and it'll be kicking time for the Hurricanes. Well, this rain has got to worry Jimmy Johnson with a 17-point lead. He's lucky he's got that 17-point lead. If he didn't have it, this would be an even game in the slop and the rain. Your offense, some people feel defense suffers more from rain. I don't believe that. I think precision offense does. Tim Corral will kick it to Jimmy Young if Jimmy can field the football. Low line drive. Pretty good bounce at the 20. It's just impossible to totally reverse your field now. Flag on the play. So LSU will take over deep in its own territory. Flag is lying at the 26. Now you hate to see a call like that if you're the receiving team because punt returns don't take very long tonight to materialize. By the way, Tony Moss is back in for the Tigers. Tommy Hodson, 13, entering your screen, is back in at quarterback. So all the way back at the 11-yard line are the Tigers. LSU needs to complete short passes and make the Miami defenders miss. They have done that in the past. Long passes will work in this weather. Eddie Fuller and Jay Egloff for the backs. This is Fuller. Stripped of the football. Picked up by the Hurricanes. 22 is Randy Shannon. He's caused three fumbles this year, and this time he gets one recovered. Again, a lot of people say that offense, defense suffers. I think it's offense. There's Mark stringing it out. The ball is loose. It was Rod Carter knocking it loose, and then this is the thing, of course, the LSU fans were hoping would happen to Miami when they had the ball. It happened to LSU instead. So, just outside the Tigers' 10-yard line, turnovers a factor so far, and Miami will spend a time out here with 12-11. The rain is easing somewhat, but it's still one of our Tim Brando quagmires here in Baton Rouge. top by 17 threatening to make it more our student athlete of the game brought to you by the u.s army get an edge on life be all you can be tonight's recipient miami defensive end bill hawkins he's already completed his undergraduate work with a 3.2 in business and now he's pursuing a master's degree in finance not a bad football player either all american out there on that right end first down for the canes at the tiger 11. Following Cleveland Gary is Leonard Conley. You see 43 on the ground there, blocking four. Leonard, the sophomore, Jimmy Young, and Jamie Bice from the secondary on the stops. But Miami down inside the seven. They get a cave-in block by Andre Brown, number 83. The guy is 6'3", 212-pound wide receiver. Does a nice job. He's sealed about three people. LSU players, but the rest of the defense covered up. LSU again, very tough defensively. If you just tuned in, the score is really field position more than anything. They can get a first down without scoring. Conley inside the five. Ron Sancho, the 6'2", 230 senior out of Avondale, Louisiana. Meeting him there. Miami coaches felt but the Tiger defense was the fastest, and they compared it to Notre Dame and felt that they had better personnel across the board and played better defense than Notre Dame. And remember that the Irish beat this team. So coming in, they knew that LSU could play defense. They're down at the four. Conley, no, sir. Eric Hill 
from outside the linebacker, the defensive MVP of a year ago, now one of the defensive captains for LSU, met him head on, and the Canes will have to kick. From the side, he's never had a chance. Eric Hill, and of course, what you do defensively on the goal line is you just come after the offense. Eric Hill's been around a long time, could be a number one pick. Great athlete and a huge kid, 6'2", 245, outside linebacker with speed. As you see, Huerta perfect from short range. This one will be a 21-yarder right in between the goalposts. He almost hooked it too much, but it is through. And four minutes and 49 seconds into the second quarter, Miami by 20. Tim Brando, we've got one of your quagmires going here in Baton Rouge. Yeah, but if you move up further to the north, the northwest, the Pacific Northwest to be exact, the rain turns into snow. Tim Rosenbach, after a block punt for Washington State, gets into the end zone. Nice, but it's scrambling. He bruised some ribs. He's out of the game right now, but the Cougars lead it 32-31. Well, they used to say it never rained in Tiger Stadium, but then again, I don't believe Bob Carpenter, Kevin Kiley, and Chris Fowler had ever been there all together at the same time. Gentlemen? <laughs> hey, Chris Fowler is the only one we're worried about right now. Upstairs, warm and dry with Kevin Kiley, Bob Carpenter, and the Canes have been tough so far. That's been a game of field position. LSU has not received any decent field position. They made two stands close to their goal line. They both resulted in field goals, but their offense needs first downs, and so far they haven't been able to get it. And what about the LSU offense in these conditions, Kev? Well, I, I think, as I said earlier, I think they have to go for short passes and hope that the defense overruns, slips on the grass or something like that. They need to get it to Moss. That's going to be a problem now because they'll be looking out for him with a big lead. Get it to their quick people like Slip Black. will kick it again. At his own 10, Slip Watkins. Got away from one tackle. Great position out to the 40. Finally brought down by Miami's number two, Charles Farms, that freshman defensive back on special team. Farms is a guy that Miami did not recruit. He went looking for Miami. Oklahoma said, if you come here, we'll give you a starting position in the defensive backfield, make you another Ricky Dixon. Charles said, I want to go to Miami. Contacted the Miami coaches, said, I want to come here, and they recruited him, and they brought him in. Well, he didn't want to play in the Southwest Conference. He's out of Houston. He said defensive backs in the Big Eight are like linebackers. You don't get to defend against passing too much. Up the middle, there's Tony Moss. Over midfield, down to the 35 of Miami. And there's the big play the Tigers have been waiting for. 24 yards on the completion. Well, Hudson gets knocked. He gets knocked quite a bit here in Tigerland. But this is what he can do that Gidry cannot. Moss, they're trying to double. There's the slip I talked about in the defensive secondary. And Hudson rifles it into the chest of Moss. Moss is the big play receiver that needs to get free in the secondary. That's all pass. Really, Moss didn't make much of a move. It was Hudson's accuracy. Tony Moss, two catches for 36 as he motions right side. He's in the pattern, and there he is. He pulls it down inside the 20. Bobby Harden, strong safety on the stop, but outstanding running and concentration by Tony Moss, and the Bengals are getting emotional now. Well, the crowd's getting back into it. Miami wanted to double this guy all over the field. They put him in motion to keep him from doubling. They flood. You see how they flood? He gets in the dead spot. And then Hudson, tremendous catch in the rain by Moss, but he is the receiver most capable of doing that for LSU. The Tigers get a touchdown here. This crowd's going to get back into it, and anything could happen. Yeah, and a little bit of a late pile on there by Maurice Crum. Miami lucky enough to get a flag on that. There's Calvin Windham inside the five and a fumble. But it looks like Alvin Lee got it for LSU. On a night like tonight, you've got to follow your ball carriers. You just can't give up and think he's going to hold on. Alvin Lee downfield, a lovely, keeping it for LSU. Watch 89, Halliburton on 57. Clark, the middle linebacker, a screen block. Now, Wyndham is a very tough inside runner. Not much on the corners. You can see the ball coming loose there. He made a nice run, and they got lucky when McDowell 
the ball loose, but LSU was able to come up with the recovery. Hold on to that ball. First and goal for the Tigers. Alvin Windham straight ahead. Greg Mark met him. Jimmy Johnson now watching as Mike Archer's LSU Tigers are threatening to score for the first time tonight. There's Butch Davis, Jimmy's defensive line coach, over on the other side, intense concentration by the young second-year coach who played and was an assistant for the University of Miami. And slipping and he's down. They'll mark it back at the seven yard line. He tripped off his center, Todd Kuti. Well, the weather. We talked about the weather. Now, the weather gave Miami three points at the other side of the field because Fuller fumbled the ball. Hudson just a little slow. The pants are wet. The feet don't move so fast. He trips over Ubix. And that's a big play because now it's third and long, whereas they had a chance to maybe score a touchdown on second down. Kubik's the right guard just to the right of the center, Todd Coody. And now it's third and goal at the seventh. Tigers on the air, a 37% team on third down. Not much tonight. Fighting off a blitz, Hodson has to dump it. Hurricanes were in the backfield in a hurry. Randy Shannon pressuring Tommy Hudson. Well, Miami with their back to the goal line knows LSU can only complete a pass, and they can try to mess it up. Here comes Shannon right through the gap, and Hudson trying to lay it out for Moss. Moss never had a chance to even break on the ball. It's a good defensive call by Miami. Again, the rain, it really disrupts offensive precision. David Browndyke from 25 yards. Most accurate on the year, 15 of 17. He had a big miss earlier this year that would have tied a game at Ohio State, and a big miss here. Hurricane still by 20. We're 7 12 from halftime in rainy, wet Baton Rouge. Miami on top by 20 with the football as the rain has virtually stopped. Little shovel from Walsh ahead to Cleveland Gary. Cleveland in semi heavy traffic, couldn't catch it. Earlier, LSU problems with the punting game and now with the place kicking team. Snap's not supposed to hit you in the chest. It does hit Chris Mook in the chest. Does a good job getting it down. The timing may be just a little bit off. And the field goal is yanked. That was Brown back missing the field goal. But again, these conditions, anything can happen. Cleveland Gary has to dive over the line to get a couple, but they're going to say the ground caused the fumble. LSU came up with a football. Darrell Phillips undercutting the ball carrier. Cleveland Gary lost it when he made contract with the wet turf. Bobby Garcia is the center for Miami. Rod Holder is out with an injury. Garcia, Phillips holding him up and then getting over underneath Gary. The ball comes loose after he hits the ground. Hey, how do you sack Steve Walsh? Kev? They've only done it. Opponents have against Miami twice all year, two times in eight ball games. There's a reason why. A lot of time. Andre Brown, even with his athleticism, couldn't get outside to grab that one. As Steve Walsh, in a rather rare form, overthrew the ball badly on the sideline. I think you see the frustration on that shot in Walsh's eyes. And this game is not put away yet. We're talking snapping for punts here. Field goals, you saw that. Carrying the ball, it was a fumble uh, when he hit the ground. Anything can happen. Tim Kalau at his own 10. Greg Jackson at his 45. Tigers should get good field position. They almost blocked it. Good bounce for Miami. Ball's dead at the 43. Tigers take over there, and here's Tim Brando. 
It's time now for our Panasonic video replay of the day. And once again, Barry Sanders did the honors. The junior Heisman candidate here goes 80 yards. He took aim in Ames, Iowa, as the Cowboys took on Iowa State, won it 49-28. There are his numbers. He needs but 49 yards to surpass Marcus Allen for the single season rushing record. Could it be he's about to rip the Heisman away from Tinseltown? Let's get back to Bob. All right, Timmy, LSU with the football. Good field position for the Tigers, and good running ahead. There's the freshman, Vincent Fuller. 5'9", 179 from Leesville, Louisiana, younger brother of Eddie Fuller, a converted cornerback to running back. And how about the snap on the punt a few moments ago? Well, again, remember, the ground is soaking wet. The center has to snap a ball that's getting damp, and LSU is coming after this and almost gets it up the middle. And that's going to cause the punt not to go all that far, and LSU will have a shot at every one of those throughout the game. Tigers got four on that first play. Vincent Fuller again. Randy Shannon on the stop. Fuller, a true freshman. You look at programs that are as strong as LSU and Miami. You'll only see a handful of players that ever see action in their true freshman years. The redshirt programs are in full effect with powerful schools like these. And look at the average field position. Miami averaging starting about 24 yards better than LSU. It's death and Death Valley for LSU just on field position. inside the 30 the tight end Willie Williams you know that ball was delivered a little bit behind him maybe that's the only place it could have been caught I really have to laugh I've been in this position a million times Bernard Clark 57 has tremendous coverage on the tight end but he's got to turn around see the thing about defense is when the receiver turns around you have to turn your head he never turned around if he had he'd have been able to get his hands on the ball Tommy Hodgson now, 6 of 11 for 89 yards deep drop down the middle and slipping a bit was Ronnie Halliburton or he would have had that one down at the five as he made his move to the football he just couldn't get the push off he needed so did Bobby Harden slip now Bobby Harden was the safety in the middle of the field and he didn't have a chance when the offensive man made his cut the defensive fellow could this is a to have a wet field is such a great equalizer for LSU because their offense frankly coming into this game against Miami's defense didn't have much of a chance and now it's a wide open game. sideline Alvin Lee as a sophomore he had to back up the All-American Wendell Davis only caught a couple of passes for 25 yards a year ago but they lost All-American Wendell Davis Todd Kinchin as Kevin mentioned earlier injured hard to replace guys like Davis and Alvin Lee now as a junior getting his chance and the other thing that the uh, wet ground will do is it will cause Miami to play softer defensively until they get close to the goal line. They'll play a soft zone that'll keep their coverages to a minimum and they'll try to keep things in front of them and that'll open up the passing game for Hudson. Run and left. Well, on third and one, Victor Jones. You know, at this stage of the game, LSU may be in four down territory. After what happened on the field goal a few moments ago, it may be time to go for it if they did not make it, and they did not on third down. Problem for the offensive line, you need to be able to get traction to push people out. You're looking at all this power, but you see the penetration there by Marks or Hawkins. That was Hawkins, 54, getting underneath. All the defense has to do is stack people up. The offensive line has to push people out. They've got a wing back and two behind the quarterback on fourth and one. in the end zone by Charles Farms, the freshman out of Houston. First interception of his collegiate career. He's only been a starter for the last four games. And on fourth and one, Hodson with play action throwing into the turnover. Well, I, th I think they wanted to get the ball to Wyndham. That was a desperate. Watch Wyndham trying to get out of the backfield. 
This is defensive holding. See that? There's the official right there. He missed it. Bobby Harden grabbed him. And so Hudson had to check off and throw into coverage. And of course, he got the interception by Farms, but it was Wyndham they were trying to slip out. And Harden, I guess, heads up, grabbed him by the shirt. So LSU with a possible 10 points uncashed in their last two times down the field. It stopped raining, so back to the air go the Hurricanes. And Fred Highsmith, on his first snap of the night, has the catch, his second of the year. He's also run it 15 times for 89 yards. A 6'1 senior from Jacksonville, a fifth-year senior, who's jockeyed back and forth between offense and defense as needed. I think as the teams get down to the close to the end zone, it happened to Miami on the other end, LSU just said, you can see the difficulty of doing anything quick and with precision. And so you're going to really need to score from further out. It's going to be tough to run or throw it in. Second and one. That's Shannon Crowell, the sophomore. They'll move the chains as he's out over the 30. Greg Jackson, weak side safety on him to make the stop. Less than three minutes from halftime, Tim Brando and Bino Cook standing by with scores and highlights, and also an interview with unbeaten Southern Cal's Larry Smith. The Trojans, if beating Notre Dame a week from now, will be in control of their own destiny for the national championship. Notre Dame, of course, the same if they can win that one. Walls giving it to Crowell. Clint James from right end on the stop. You won't hear this stadium this quiet on a Saturday night very often. Bobby Garcia, number 50, blocking down on Darrell Phillips, the middle guard, and doing a nice job of it. Nice grab initially by Mike Merla. We'll put you way upstairs. They added an upper deck on the west side of the stadium a couple of years ago to increase the capacity to nearly 80,000. Second and five, clock under two minutes. This is Crowell again. Fumble in the air. And did LSU cover before it got off the field? No, they did not. Out there was Carl Dunbar, 63 giving chase. The ball snuck over the out-of-bounds line before LSU could grab it. Oh, this is great stuff. Hill does a nice job on the outside, 54. Stringing it out. And then the ball's loose and out. <laughs> Hit the helmet of Mike Sullivan, which helped Miami. The left guard with his best offensive moving the football play of the year. <laughs> it was baseball, he gets an assist. Soccer, it's a header. Okay. First down, Miami. A little short pass up the middle. Nothing doing there for Fred Highsmith. On the play, defending Ron Sancho along with Mark Boutte. Clock will stop with a minute 41 in Washington State. What a season for Dennis Erickson and that crew up there. 32-31. Iowa holding on against the Gophers in the Big Ten. Fresno State, California Bull bound, hammering Long Beach State. California Bull here on ESPN, Saturday, December 10th. the tight end. Bethel, a 6'3", 240 sophomore out of Vero Beach, a converted defensive end. Still picking up the system here, but they really like this guy as an athlete, and he'll be a very good tight end, says Gary Stevens, the Miami offensive coordinator. Although Bethel says that now playing offense, he does miss hitting people. But well, he just got his chance there, but the problem with hitting people offensively when you're receivers, you have to hold on to the ball. That's right. 240 page playbook they handed Randy and he said learn it fast. Third and short with a minute left. Up top goes Walls and it's picked off by Greg Jackson. The weak safety to the near side. He's got some room. He'll get to near midfield at least. And up to the 49 of LSU. A flag flies after he goes out of bounds. That could tack on a bunch more. Sullivan, Mike Sullivan chasing him after the interception. Well, the 
problem again is you need to be careful when you're throwing it up. The Walsh's pass. Now here's Brown going down the middle. Looks like he's open, but the pass is a balloon, a helicopter. Call it what you want. And he lays it up there and intercepts it. Jackson, who ran one back 100 yards last week, knows what to do with it when he gets it. He's going to take off for at least midfield. They're going to tack another 15 on. Let's look and see if Sullivan is the one they call the penalty on at the end of this play. Watch for 79. He's out, and now he's hit. Now Miami has had some problems with penalties. They had 17 penalties against East Carolina for 118 yards and 13 penalties against Tulsa for 93 yards. This is a team that gets penalized. Blake Jackson, of course, you see having a big year. He now has 10 on his career with those six this season. Tony Moss motioning. There he is across the middle. Near hash mark as Randy Shannon wraps him up. 40 seconds on the clock. LSU has all three timeouts remaining, and the Tigers will spend one here with 37 seconds left in the first half. Basically a must-score situation for the Tigers, trailing 20 nothing to Miami. LSU on the move. We'll be back to Baton Rouge in a moment. Well, no guarantees that history will repeat itself, but Michigan led Ohio State 20 nothing at the half today and almost lost. And LSU trailed 15 nothing at Bama a couple of weeks ago. Came back to win. There's Tony Moss again. He's loose down to the 20. Randy Shannon on the coverage, along with strong safety Bobby Harden. Clock stops as they move the chains. 30 seconds remaining in this 20-0 game. LSU would get a huge lift by getting seven before halftime. Well, Miami wants to give up a completion, if it is a completion, in the middle short. They're going to protect everything else. Hudson with time. Down the middle. At the 10. Tight end, Ronnie Halliburton. That will move the chains again. He just got enough yards for the first down. So they'll move the chains, but now LSU's Mike Archer will call timeout anyway. With 17 seconds to go. Tight end is the logical receiver, number 89. The reason they're giving it up here is because if they keep it in the middle, they have to use timeouts. See that? Ooh, almost dropped that thing, didn't he? Yeah, got it down around his knees after the initial touch. Oh, another shot of this. <laughs> Whoa. Hard to tell. I'll give it to him. Maurice Crum all over him. Look for Moss on a slant here. Now, if I'm LSU, what I'm thinking is to put Tony Moss, their best receiver, to the wide side of the field, the offensive left, try to pick him, which is illegal, but we don't call it illegal, and then have him slant and have Hudson try to hit him quick. Protection is a key here, because if he's not open right away, he might be open after a count or two. Well, Hudson has been hitting them quick lately. First quarter, three of eight for only 22 yards. After the Reigns game, he's seven for nine with one picked off for 99 yards. So a collective 10 for 17 for 121 yards. In the rain, when you're playing defense, your pants get wet, your socks get wet, your legs get heavy. It's tough to react. And remember, the offensive player knows where he's going on a quick slam pattern or any kind of quick move. It could be very difficult for Miami to react as quickly as they would in dry weather. Moss shoe. Moss is to the right, Bobby. There he is. Second and one. They do have one timeout remaining. Looking Tony Moss's way. End zone. A little bit overthrown. Bubba McDowell on the coverage. It'll be third down with 11 seconds remaining. Now, all the elements were there, but remember, the ground is wet, and the play just doesn't happen at the same rate that it would happen in practice. So this is a timing type of thing. It takes longer for Moss, who is on the left now, and he's going to try to get out there in the corner of the end zone. Hudson has to try to judge how slow he's going to be. Carter has no chance. The defender has no chance there, but the ball is overthrown because of the speed of the play. So on a dry field, that might be a touchdown, but not here. They might not be this close on a dry field. <laughs> he just got it away. And over the head of Farms, the freshman safety, Greg Mark, all over Tommy Hodson, who looks at the scoreboard and sees fourth down, one to go, five seconds remaining. Miami 20, LSU nothing, and the Tigers, who've squandered two scoring opportunities already, will now try to settle for that three. Well, they, 
they're getting booze for this, but this is absolutely the right decision. Get three, go into the locker room, regroup. Mike Abear, the linebacker, is the snapper. Chris Mook, the holder. Brown Dyke, who missed earlier, the kicker, and he didn't miss that time. David Brown Dyke, a 27-yarder, and one second remaining in the first half. So it's 20 to three, but Tiger fans, Kevin, right now have to be thinking about what could have been. It could have been 20 to 10. It could be 20 to 13 at this time. Well, two goal line stands by LSU. Remember, they stopped them and held Miami to two field goals. Uh, I, you know, from my perspective, the way this game started, it seems to me that uh, that LSU is doing okay. That's what's coming your way tomorrow, NFL game day. Previews and features, scores and highlights coming after that on NFL Prime Time. And then. New England Patriots playing very well lately against the Miami Dolphins at 8 p.m. Eastern, live tomorrow night on ESPN. Dale Brown, the LSU basketball coach, ducking into the booth. We had the pleasure last year on ESPN to cover Dale's Tigers up at Hartford against Georgetown. Took a last second 50 footer to beat you, coach. And of course, coming up at halftime, Tim and Bino are standing by with scores and highlights. And they'll also have a chat with Southern Cal's Larry Smith. Another big win for the Trojans today over their arch rivals from UCLA. Well, uh, there's a lot of people in this country that were rooting for UCLA to upset USC. We've thrown a lot of teams back in the national uh, title picture. Didn't happen. Brown Dyke will ground it and taken at the 35-yard line by the Hurricanes. That brings the first half to a close. Miami 20, LSU finally on the scoreboard with a field goal. That's the story from Baton Rouge. And now at halftime, here's Tim Brando. All right, Bob, Kevin, and Chris, thank you very much. Well, one quagmire swamp style down there in Baton Rouge, and right now the Miami Hurricanes are getting it done their way against LSU. Well, we've got a lot to cover here at halftime. We're going to put Showdown Saturday in perspective for you. Bino Cook will join me. Scores and highlights from all the games across the country. Plus, we'll look at the bowl picture. And who is that guy? on the crossbar in Pullman, Washington. Well, he's a Washington State fan, of course. And the reason, Washington State pulled off a huge win. They won the Apple Cup Championship, beating Washington 32 to 31. They are headed to the Aloha Bowl, obviously. Well, the quagmire turned into the Garden of Eden, didn't it? Uh, taking a bite of a big apple, Washington State with a win. Minnesota, the Golden Gophers, losing to Iowa that now in the third quarter, 25-22. And Fresno State, the Bulldogs, over Long Beach State at halftime, 24-0. Those are just three of many more scores that we have on our telethon without a tote board called our College Football Halftime Show. We'll come right back in just a minute. Showdown Saturday here on ESPN. Tim Brando back in our college football studios. And let's start by telling you what happened in Pasadena. Let's show you USC and UCLA. The game meant a lot in Rodney Peake. What a story coming off about with the measles. Hitting Eric Affolder. Watch him. Oh, he's going to go down the sidelines for the touchdown. 14-3 Trojans. Now 14-9, still in the second quarter. Hot Rod sneaks in from the one. 21-9 USC. 21-9 late in the second quarter. The men of Troy take it from Troy. Aikman, touchdown. 21-16 at the half. Third quarter, Aaron Emanuel. Doesn't get a lot of pub because of Sweet Pete. But boy, does Sweet Pete love to see this run. One of many on the day for Aaron Emanuel. 28-16 Trojans. Final score, 31-22. And the Trojans are in great shape now should they beat Notre Dame to control their own destiny in the Rose Bowl. And after the game, our Chris Myers caught up with a very happy Coach Larry Smith. Thanks very much, Tim. We're with Larry Smith and Coach. You got the kind of game you wanted. Rodney Pete was amazing today. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. That was a great football team out there. I'm going to tell you what, to fight back from all that adversity all week, that's a great team. I'm going to tell you. And that kid is something else. I'll tell you something. Right, you know you're going to the Rose Bowl. How about the Heisman? Is Rodney deserving of that? He and the Heisman, I don't know who isn't. That's the greatest, guttiest, damnedest performance I've ever seen in my life. All right, one more. You got Notre Dame and then the national championship. All right. Thanks very much, Coach Larry Smith. USC a winner, 31 to 22. Their first time ever beating UCLA here at the Rose Bowl. From Pasadena, this is Chris Myers. Let's go back to Tim Brando. 
All right, Chris, thank you very much. Best interview by, while walking to a locker room I've ever seen. Notre Dame, they're prepared, too. And the reason, on Monday, Lou Holtz will get his entire team vaccinated against influenza and measles. So they're prepared for Sweet Pete. They won today over Penn State. West Virginia, they, of course, were taking on Syracuse. Mighty Mountaineers trying to stay in position for that Fiesta Bowl meeting with Notre Dame. Oh, they were steaming. Oh, the Mountaineers were hot tonight. Trailing 7-0 Syracuse on the move. Todd Fulcox in the end zone. Turning point of the game, really. Did any fumbles in the Orange failed to score. Just before halftime, Fulcox throws over the middle, and Theron Ellis makes the interception. This set up a one-yard touchdown. It was 14-3 at the half, West Virginia. This was the backbreaker. Fulcox picked off again. Willie Edwards right down the sidelines. It's a touchdown. Syracuse had six turnovers. That was the story of this game as Don Nealon's club gets it done. 11-0, 31-9. Congratulations to Coach Naylor. Now let's move on. Nebraska, the Mighty Huskers beat Oklahoma. Three points for Oklahoma, fewest points they've scored against uh, Nebraska since 1942. Michigan and Ohio State, 34-31. Wolverines move on into the Rose Bowl. Oklahoma State and Iowa State, 49-28. Barry Sanders, 293 yards. More on him later. South Carolina and Clemson, the Tigers get the win. Danny Ford, 29-10, heading to the Citrus Bowl. Houston and a squeaker had to come from behind. Jason Phillips with a touchdown catch to win the game. He had 11. He leads the nation, of course. Stanford and California, 19-19 tie. Moving on, the Oregon Ducks against the Oregon State Beavers. The Beavers get the win. 21-10. Wisconsin and Michigan State as we move on to the Big Ten. Spartans get the victory 36-0. They're Gator Bowl bound. Indiana, 52-7 over Purdue. Anthony Thompson, 167 yards rushing today. Illinois, 14-9 over Northwestern. Keith Jones, 118 yards on the ground. On to the Big Eight. Colorado beating Kansas State, 56-14. Missouri in a big way for Coach Woody Woodenhofer, 55-17. On to the Southwest Conference. R.C. Slocum, the defensive coordinator, gets the victory in a shutout, too, over the Horned Frogs. More on Jackie Cheryl and the developments in College Station a bit later. Now as we move on, Baylor, Grant Tapp with a win over Texas today, 17-14. The Mean Green of North Texas out of Division I AA with another win over a Southwest Conference opponent, beating Rice today by 16. The Golden Hurricane of Tulsa, 15-10 over Temple. Boston College against Army and BC gets the win in Ireland today, 38-24 the final. On to the ACC where Maryland loses to Virginia, 24-23 the final. They close with five straight wins to the Wahoos. North Carolina and Duke, Steve Spurrier not on the sideline. Didn't seem to matter. Mac Brown's team goes down by six. The Wolfpack of NC State, Coach Sheridan just keeps winning. 7-3-1 on the year as he beats Pitt today, 14-3. Wake plays to a tie. Really cost him the Independence Bowl. UTEP will be headed there as they tie at Appalachian State. On to the Southeastern Conference. Tennessee beating... Uh, uh, Kentucky, 28-24. Vanderbilt goes down. Memphis State did the honors again. The final, 28-9. Coach Bailey's a happy man tonight. Tulane, t now 5-5 five and five on the year, headed into their LSU game coming up next week, 27-23. They beat the Bulldogs. They've lost nine straight. On to the WAC, where San Diego State fired Denny Stoltz this past week. New Mexico goes down 18-10 a week later. BYU, look at this score, 57-28. It's been a long while since BYU has taken it on the chin like that from anybody in the WAC. Moving on, Air Force down to UTEP 31-24 as we said the Miners will be going into the Independence Bowl. A lot more scores coming up. We'll update the Sherrill situation in College Station. Beano Cook will join me as well and we'll take a look at the Bulls on this showdown Saturday in a moment. Pride, dedication, and love explain Miami's success. Quality education and research depend on that kind of motivation from faculty, students, and alumni. It is a challenge going here, and it should be. The most important thing this university has to offer is the total experience of living, studying, and working in South Florida. The University of Miami, one of the finest private universities in the United States. On to the Ivy League. The game wasn't really the game. The reason? Cornell taking on Penn today. And the final score there, 19-6. Those two share the Ivy League title. Well, it is the game. Let's face it. Yale, 26-17 over Harvard today. Dartmouth, the big green, 24-17 over Princeton. Brown goes down to Columbia. The Lions get their second win of the year, 31-13. Rhode Island and Connecticut in the Yankee Conference. And the Roadies get the victory by two. Boston and Delaware, the Blue Hens, roll on into the Division I AA championships, it appears. 
and UMass, 6442 over New Hampshire today. William and Mary goes down to Richmond, 24-19. Spiders get their fourth win of the year. The Maine Black Bears, 20 to 17 over Illinois. They're seven and four on the season. Lehigh and Lafayette as we move on to the Colonial. Lafayette, the Leopards get the win, 52-45. Holy Cross, Mark Duffner's team wins, 52-30 today over a stubborn Northeastern crew. Colgate goes down to Rutgers, 41 to 22. Rutgers blocked two punts in that ball game. On to the Big West where Utah State loses to Cal Fullerton, 23-13, and the Titans are now five and six. San Jose State, 42 to nothing, a shutout of the running rubs, and no, Randall Cunningham's no longer with them, is he? New Mexico State and Pacific, 21-20. The Tigers get the victory, their second of the year. And on to the Big Sky where the Vandals beat Boise State, 26 to 20, and they're now nine and one on the year. Weber State and Northern Arizona, that game tied at 14. On to the MAC now, where Central Michigan beat Miami of Ohio, 34-17. Western Michigan, the Broncos going to the California Bowl. You'll see that on ESPN. They beat Ohio U, 23-16. Northern Iowa, Earl Bruce is now five and five on the year, 24-21. There are reports he could be going to Minnesota, Coach Bruce. The Citadel, 17. Furman gets the victory, 30 to 17 today. And VMI beating Western Carolina, 20. 24 to 20 as the military cadets get the victory. The thundering herd of Marshall, 38 to 15 over Youngstown State. They could be headed to Pocatello once again. They were the runners up in Division I AA last year. Virginia Tech beating James Madison, 27 to 6 today. The Dukes go down. They're 5 and 6 now. Georgia Southern, Irk Russell's team had won two back-to-back -back Division I AA championships. He may be headed for third in the decade of the 80s. Liberty, 20 to 14 over Towson State. And East Carolina beating Cincinnati, 49 to 14. The Bulls picture we will put in perspective for you on this showdown Saturday and we'll hear from Bino Cook on the Jackie Sherrill situation in College Station but as we go to break let's show you now some scores from the Division 2 and 3 playoffs on this College Football Saturday. than 50 years, a distinguished football legacy second to none. Bowl victories, television appearances, All-American honors, national recognition. The Southeastern Conference, 10 universities for all America. The ballot of Barry Sanders continues. And remember this, the Eastern media is going to vote for Sanders because he's not from the West Coast. Interesting because an Oklahoma State star will benefit from the Eastern media in the voting. There he is with another touchdown, one of many today, 32 carries, 293 yards. Barry Sanders, his numbers just continue to pile. He'd get my vote. He'll probably get a few other votes as well in the Heisman balloting. So, Barry Sanders with another big day. Now, let's talk about the bowl situation, Bino. Notre Dame and West Virginia in the Fiesta Bowl. Still don't know whether it's going to be January 2nd or January 3rd in prime time. And the Rose Bowl. Michigan and USC, they could control their own destiny if they win against yeah. Notre Dame. Michigan's wasting its time going west. And the Orange Bowl, of course. Miami of Florida will get Nebraska rather than Oklahoma. Again, Nebraska plays a road game in the bowl game. What's ever happened to the Sugar Bowl? They can't get an unbeaten team in the SEC. Well, it's got tough to go through that league now since everybody he plays seven games. And in the Cotton Bowl, it appears UCLA now goes against Arkansas. Arkansas wanted Florida State. And the Citrus Bowl. That'll be a colorful uh, duo. Yeah. R red and orange. Ugly. <laughs> a little tacky. And in the Gator Bowl, a Big Ten team gets in with Georgia. Three Pac-10 teams get in, and that's a very tough league to only have three in. Yeah, and the Big Ten gets five. But Michigan State closed real well, won a bunch of games at the end. All right, now the report, of course, as we told you earlier tonight, George Smith is now denying the report in the Dallas Morning News. Jackie Sherrill did not coach in today's game. He says he will coach next week. Smith, of course, allegedly said to the Dallas Morning News that he accepted $4,400 worth of hush money since 1986, and that, of course, meant uh, that uh, Jackie Sherrill was in a bit of trouble. Well, number one is I don't believe this newspaper would print all this if it did not have it mm -hmm. on tape, and plus showed it to, it to the lawyers. Mm -hmm. I believe the players said it. 
Now, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But I, if he said it, I don't blame the player, uh, the paper for printing it. By the way, the president of the university says that his coach never resigned. He was never asked to resign. Jackie Sherrill will be on the sidelines Thursday night on Thanksgiving night when Texas, Texas on Texas A&M. We'll be right back. here on ESPN. That's right. We'll be right back We're on ESPN in just a minute. Some people say the sky is the limit. For them, there are no boundaries, there are no confines. Our future is shaped by those who hold this vision, because our future depends on research and the men and women who make it their life's work. At Louisiana State University, the future is happening now. The research and discoveries at LSU today are shaping tomorrow for all of us. It's been raining all night long in Baton Rouge, and after a rainy game like that, they'll be wanting hot boudin and cold couche couche after tonight's game. Let's get back out to Bob Carpenter and Kevin Kiley. All right, Timmy, thank you very much. It's 20 to 3 at halftime. Miami on top of the LSU Fighting Tigers. The field is wet, it's muddy. The band, they just had alumni band night here, so instead of about 150 pieces, they had about 300 pieces down there, and that'll make it even worse, Kev. Band had a rough time. I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to say LSU's going to get back in this game, and we've got a close ball game. I think Miami's offense, and all that they do, and the fact they rely on a pass game, they're going to be paralyzed in the mud down there, and I think LSU's offense really uh, benefits from this, and their defense should be able to hold them. I'll say they get within three, and it'll be a close game by the fourth quarter. Well, the Tigers certainly have had their chances, a squandered chip shot of a field goal a first and goal situation that pays off in no points finally the field goal this conceivably could be a one touchdown difference ball game right now well Miami too has had some difficulty close in and, and not scored and been stopped twice by the LSU defense I don't think that LSU is really capable of beating Miami at this point on a dry field but we don't have a dry field which is good and uh, for those of us that are looking for an exciting game I think we're gonna have one I think LSU come out take some chances and they will they're really one touchdown from being back in the game and getting the crowd back in the game. their defense we talked about them at the outset of our telecast tonight a couple of crucial situations they bend it a little bit but they did not break in other words giving up three instead of seven and that has kept LSU again in a position to win this ball game or at least get back in it and we repeat this is a team that trailed by 15 on the road at Tuscaloosa and not many have ever come back from that situation to even get in a ball game much less win well two turnovers you talked about them and they did hold defensively field position has been critical they knew before the game Mike Archer told us Pete Jenkins told us it had to be a game of field position and they didn't have it and they really paid the price in the first quarter but they've hung in there and they're a team that's in very good shape and the, the wet ground will there'll be a fatigue factor and I don't know that the edge hasn't been taken off the Miami team they may prove me wrong here in the second half but I think at home if the crowd can stay in the game LSU has a shot in this game so some of our outlook on the first half and here's some of the numbers as we look back on the first half of play Miami with only eight completions you don't see that very often and trailing in passing yardage to its opponent rushing yardage Miami with a big lead there and the total yards not that much of a difference but the punting game has been a problem for LSU the kicking game overall a problem for the home team well, Mike Archer and his young team have been tested a couple of times this year and come from behind situations we'll see how they react tonight slip Watkins nearest to number two 27 is Vincent Fuller so the Tigers will have the football here in the second half Watkins lets it go over his head it's at the five he's got no choice but to run and he is in trouble at the 11 yard line as slip Watkins misjudged the ball in the air let's check the Tiger possessions in the first half of play just three plays and a punt four plays they lost it on downs trying to kick then they lost yardage and punted punted again after moving the ball a little bit again negative yardage before a kick then the fumble deep in their own territory the defense did a good job a nice drive with a missed field goal finally they gave it away on downs down deep and got the three just before halftime this is Calvin Windham a couple of yards Maurice Crum Bubba McDowell on the stop as the second half gets underway rain has stopped but the field very much a factor I'd be interested to know if 
when LSU went inside being home that they changed clothes it doesn't look like they did as you look at their uniforms. sometimes that'll help you if you're wet uh, there's a tremendous amount of weight involved in wearing a wet uniform when your shoes are wet doesn't look like they change shoes either single back is Victor Jones he's blocking as Hodson throws it straight ahead underneath Tony Moss there he goes out to the 40 with a move he's to midfield and still going inside the 45 of Miami an electrifying run after the catch by Tony Moss 45 yards They want to do they want to get the ball to Tony Moss and they want to get it to him underneath and then you're going to see what will happen now this could normally happen on a dry field but the wet field really helps a little dump off pass he'll make the first guy miss most of the time throughout the season he's done it and now you can see what Tony Moss can do he almost broke this three or four times he leads the SEC in average per reception Jimmy Jones Finally, defensive tackle drags him down downfield. That says a lot for the University of Miami that Jimmy Jones would get down there. Yeah, that's what you call pursuit. Wind is kicking up. No rain falling. LSU with a big play early in the third quarter. Draw to the tailback. Calvin Windham, nothing there. Wrapped up down low by Maurice Crum, up high by Bubba McDowell. It's my feeling that a deep handoff to a tailback, as that play was, is a very difficult. The reason you hand it off deep to a tailback is to give him an opportunity to change direction. It's not going to work on this field because the defense, if they just hold their ground and keep their alleys, are going to be standing there in the hole. A quick hitter, something straight, a dive. Uh, give the offensive man a time to screen block or do a little pushing out of the way and get that three or four yards. No backs in the backfield on the screen. They're coming from the corners. Hodson steps up and it's off the hands of Calvin Windham with Bobby Harden on the coverage. The reason they went to a no back formation that gave them five quick receivers and the reason they're doing it number six second man in a little bit left of your screen. There's no way you can double cover them. In fact they don't even cover them when you have five quick receivers. Hudson never looked at it. He's looking the other way overthrows the ball and the guy you want to get the ball to is Tony Moss number six. You saw Randy Shannon strong side linebacker coming from outside. Third and long. Looking right side. He's got Calvin Windham. That is enough for a first down. He had to get to the 34 of Miami, and he's beyond the marker. They'll move the chains again. Maurice Crum again with Bubba McDowell on the coverage. LSU had this formation ready whether it rained or not but in the rain it's a very effective formation the pass rush you can't get the traction it's going to slow down Miami's ability to get to Hudson and it's going to free up some receivers and they're going out of it now but the last two times no backs in the backfield Windham on the carry fullback Victor Jones leading the way Rod Carter met him head on as good a linebacker as there is, end of quote, says Jimmy Johnson, about number 91, Rod Carter. A great deal of what you do in football that makes you a good football player comes from your legs. That's why you squat. Tremendous strength that you have in your legs. When it rains and you can't get traction, you lose your legs. And a lot of great football players, tremendous players, become average players. That's Bill Hawkins, the All-American, who's hurt. Looks like he's dazed a bit. Shane Curry, who can back up with a tackle and end positions, a 6'4 sophomore out of Cincinnati, a former Georgia Tech transfer to Miami. He'll come in for Jimmy Johnson. A lot smaller player. Not nearly the caliber that Hawkins is. He gets away from Russell Maryland and out of bounds down near the 26-yard line. Maurice Crum forced him out. 
but it was 67 Russell Maryland that was running and reaching for the quarterback Hudson was too quick for him on second and nine and it'll become third and three he's a great story Russell Maryland he weighed 980 pounds <laughs> he seemed like it didn't he? <laughs> yeah, no. he weighed 317 pounds when he was 16 <laughs> years old he signed with Miami and the next day he was down to 265 they ran him all night the conscience his teammates gone he keeps them in line here's the third down play a little swing out left side Wyndham and he is met immediately by Bobby Harden the strong safety now the rains come again oh Wyndham we're going to telegraph this Hudson's going to Wyndham all the way and Harden's on his way stops him from getting a first down and that's a big tackle because it's a yard now for a first down and this has been a difficulty for both offenses getting a yard wouldn't be surprised to see LSU throw the ball here they've done it before in this situation I formation is not their running formation normally in this, in this situation they give it to the deep man it's Wyndham and you can look at the marker at the top of your screen and see that he got the first down Jimmy Jones and Russell Maryland collapsing from right and left tackle, but not quickly enough. LSU about to make this a very interesting football game. We're four minutes into the third quarter. There's Rod Carter, King Hercules, but going laterally and trying to get up. He gets lateral, but he doesn't get up the field far enough to stop before first down. Good power eye formation off that left side for LSU behind Rodriguez. LSU has been outstanding inside the opponent's 30, and it's Wyndham carrying, Carter meeting him, as the rain again is driving, and so is the wind here in Baton Rouge. Well, the eye toss may be the easiest running play to read for a linebacker. And you see Carter, now that's a different story. Everybody comes to that side, the, the fullback comes that way, you can see the toss, so you get right upfield and make the stop. Good play by Rod Carter. You can see the driving rain in some of our field microphones. You can hear the rain. Loss of two on that play. Tony Moss going to that left side. Now across the middle, it's Alvin Lee unable to hold on. Rod Carter trailing him. They're getting the coverage they want. On Tony Moss. They're going to get a linebacker on him, but you'll see that the linebacker, Crum, does a nice job. And then Alvin Lee coming across the middle makes a terrific adjustment underneath Carter, but he drops the ball. The rain, I don't know if you can tell on television how bad the rain is. That's the third drop pass for LSU, but it's rainy and it's windy, and the field was already wet before it started raining again. Side, it's Wyndham. He's got to do it on his own. Good coverage there by Charles Farms, the freshman safety. Well, normally we look to the flags to see which way the wind is blowing. Tonight we just look and see which way the rain is blowing. Flags are gone. Yeah, they took them down, or else they got blown to the next parish. It'll be fourth and four, and it appears the Tigers are going. Tight end. Well, with four, also the count. You have to be real careful of the count here. They don't try and draw you off. Look out for the tight end on the weak side, on the right side. They needed four, went straight ahead to Moss. Coverage all over the place by the Hurricanes. Maurice Krim in the middle, the primary linebacker in on the action. And they want interference on that. Difficult for the officials, too, because there's so many people slipping around. Moss again. Now maybe he's calling it, talking about holding here. Middle receiver, number six, underneath. Shannon reaches out. Official in front of him doesn't see it. And that's legitimate. He should have had that call. That's definitely interference. Defensive hold. Miami takes over on downs at the Hurricane 17. So a, a drive of 11 plays goes for naught for LSU. Still down by 17. This is Leonard Conley. Boy, and the thing you dread if you're on the sideline of the team that 
just had the drive stop is that the Miami Hurricanes will come out and break a quick play on you. A big play on first or second down. Pretty nice game by Conley. He got seven on first and ten. And the reason he's, they're getting seven is because the LSU defense for the last quarter, this, the entire second quarter and right here early, are trying to hold him up and go for the ball. Cleveland Gary to the far sideline. Jimmy Young runs him out. First half Miami possession chart will look like two different stories. A lot early and a little late. First down, Miami. We drew the field for you, and then in a few moments we'll show you how they got up and down the field. They did it pretty well. They were there. There they go. <laughs> they just went out for something. Else. Well, it's wet. Everything's slipping around. <laughs> There's an audible here now. Now LSU would want to change their defense now. Time for Walsh and a little bit too low for Cleveland Gary. Gary a transfer from Georgia to Miami a couple of years ago. Halfback to fullback and that's where he's making his living catching passes. Eric Hill back on the outside. One thing they want to do is they want to jam these people. That's Bethel. Bethel trying to do a little spin move. Walsh the ball was right on the actually I think he was throwing it to Bethel. I think you're right. And Cleveland Gary just kind of hanging out in the back. Second and long. Now here's a spot where maybe LSU can take a chance defensively. To the sideline, kneeling for the reception, Randall Hill. Jimmy Young on the covers, but not a whole lot he could do. On a nice timing pattern, as Hill made his turn, the ball was already on its way. We'll track the Hurricanes in the first half. Seven plays for a touchdown. Note the field position here. They then got the three. Three plays and a kick. Six plays and another touchdown again, starting at their own 30. Not bad. A kick. A field goal and then not a whole lot for the rest of the half as they had to kick it and were picked up. So look at the early field position. Mm -hmm. Leonard Conley on the carry. Ron Sancho on the tackle. Sancho and Hill. Sancho, a much celebrated defensive player. An honorable mention All-American as a junior, second team All-SEC, and he had nine sacks. He's the team leader in sacks again this year. Out of Avondale, Louisiana, Sancho, a 6'2", 230 senior. First half, you remember our stats, LSU had more passing yards than Miami did. Stop it momentarily. Clock runs now with 7.45 remaining. Third quarter, 20 to 3, Miami. Walsh hit from behind. Is it a fumble or an incompletion? It is an incomplete pass. Carl Dunbar coming from the blind side. Walsh had the arm in motion. Walsh wanted to go to the tight end. They doubled the tight end, wouldn't let him off the line of scrimmage. So Walsh trying to make an adjustment, but it's just taken too long. You see the backside rush, and I don't know that that wasn't a fumble. Carl Dunbar got his hand. Here's your tight end. Now, this is Bethel trying to release. Hill's got his hand in his face. And you got double team in here to Rudy Harmon. It just took too long. Top up the middle, and the catch from Andre Brown down the sidelines. Tries to cut inside and gets near the 10. Jimmy Young finally pulls him down, but what a touch pass by Steve Walsh over the short coverage. And the defensive back who made the first hit made a critical error. He needed to lock up. He didn't lock a tremendous hit, but did not lock up. Now, you're right, Bobby. This pass in the wet. Now, there you see, that was... Greg Jackson, he hit him with his shoulder, but you see what he did with his hands? He kept his hands in, he didn't lock up. And against the great receivers, you can't do that. Turn him loose down the sideline, and that's the net result. Andre Brown gets down 
inside the 15-yard line. Andre Brown is within three of an all-time Miami reception touchdown record. This is Leonard Conley. Nothing left, nothing right, and very little in the middle. Greg Jackson from weak safety atoning a bit for that last blunder coming up to make the stop. What a schedule remaining. Chris Fowler told you earlier about the teams the Hurricanes have already played, some they have left. Next week, they'll be home to take on those 10-0 Razorbacks, Jimmy Johnson's alma mater. BYU will be in Miami on the 3rd of December. They were handled pretty well today. UTEP got it. Or was it Utah? Good shot. Left side, and the pass completed to Cleveland Gary. Out of bounds on the near side. Miami on the move down near scoring territory. The hurricane flags are flying. Dale Dawkins split end has checked out. The tight end, Randy Bethel, is in. You have to cover Gary here. He already has a touchdown. At least he caught it and fumbled in the end zone. He's, he's playing the right wing, and you need to cover him. Here comes Shannon Crowell. They've got to get down to the one-and-a-half yard line for a first down. Mike Merla on the stop as Crowell coming from an angle left. Rushed across the middle. And Miami will go for three. Suerta with a 21-yarder has not missed from this range this year. And they couldn't get it for the spot. With it is Tim Corral, who's the punter. Louisiana State picks it up, and the Tigers have the football out at the 24-yard line. Mike Merlo all over it. And Miami makes a mistake on the kicking game. Jimmy Young with pressure on the play. Well, I told you earlier, I don't know if I did such a good job of it, but the criticism of LSU this year is that they win ugly. Everything's ugly tonight. The ball is loose, and here they go. And Sancho appears to be in the middle of just about everything. So Jimmy Young, the one that knocked the football away, covered by the Tigers, and LSU gets the turnover on a field goal situation. And again, it's still 20 to three, a touchdown, and they're right back in the game. Well, you notice how difficult it is for both these teams in close. Right. Hudson, lots of time, up the middle, off a defender. Donald Ellis on the coverage for Miami. That was never there. They were trying to post pattern, and it, you, you can imagine, it just takes forever to run a post pattern deep. It just never was there. Tom Hudson handling his adversity pretty well these days. He's been booed some and hammered a little bit by the local press. Talked to Burt Jones before the game, former LSU quarterback and NFL star. He knows Tommy Hodson, and he feels that if anybody can handle this sort of pressure, it's Hodson the junior. Burt said he got booed a few times, too. Up the field, there's Alvin Lee. Room to run at midfield into Miami territory. LSU needs to go back to that offense more often. Again, no backs in the backfield. Five quick receivers. Miami hasn't covered this thing yet from the side. Now, no one lined up in the backfield with the exception of Hodson. And then he rolls. There's no pressure here. Alvin Lee loose up the middle. Look at all that green. Looks like a pile of money there. Alvin Lee and get up the field, Alvin, to the 50-yard line. They have not covered that one formation yet. Little play action by Hodson. Looked like he wanted to load up and throw it long. He couldn't. And then it's too tall on the right side for Willie Williams, the tight end. Hodson had the look of throwing a bomb, and then he had to flare it out to the right side. Well, there's a flag. 
It was definitely pass interference. Miami's been doing it the entire game and getting away with it. Slip Watkins was loose up the field. He was just grabbed. Defensive holding. Grab defensive holding. Yeah, first time. I don't know what Jimmy's asking about. I'm a half mile from the field, and I can see it. The officials really need to be more aware of that because Miami's got away with three or four of those. So the Tigers to the Miami 40. The big play by Lee, the penalty. And now a give to the deep man. That is Slip Watkins. Just a couple covered by Maurice Crum. Crum 49, the number two tackler handling Watkins. What LSU is trying to do is catch Miami in a double zone or double coverage on the sidelines and then throw deep up the middle. It has worked. And they had a shot at it there when Slip Watkins was out. What it does it creates man to man coverage down the middle of the field? running toward the four minute mark in the third quarter. Here comes Tony Moss. Pressure screen out right side Moss near the 35. A long screen if you will for just a couple of yards. Donald Ellis at left corner. A 50 year senior. Most of these hurricanes who are seniors have been around for five years. Ellis is a tremendous player who was hurt. First game against Florida State last year, set out the entire year, had a knee injury, came back. They were one of the big question marks in the Miami defensive secondary was Don Ellis, whether he could come back from that injury and be full speed. He is, and he's a fine football player. And he's very good one-to-one -one coverage despite the knee problems. Pressure from Crum on the outside. Ball is in the air, and it's tipped down there by Bubba McDowell. Dow cutting inside Willie Williams to bat it away. It'll be fourth and five. There's no contest here. Willie Williams, if anything, the crowd is booing. If any kind of penalty should be on the offensive player from here. I think Williams started putting his hands on him to try to get through the ball. See him with the left hand, tried to shove McDowell out of the way. McDowell did a nice job. That bubble was going the other way, just stuck the hand back. And it looks like LSU is going for it on fourth and five. Just outside the 35. Now it's a long five. The marker is right at the 30. They're at the 35 and a half. Yeah, Slip Watkins or Moss. Cover them both. Who was that intended for? It was behind Moss. Slip Watkins in the pattern, and LSU will again turn it over on downs. 309, third quarter, Miami 20 to 3. ESPN Showdown Saturday, Miami and LSU is being brought to you by AC Delco. Automotive parts that don't just fit, they match. And by MCI. Let us show you how much better a long distance company can be. With Chris Fowler waddling on the sidelines and Kevin Kiley, Bob Carpenter at Tiger Stadium, Baton Rouge. Hurricanes at their own 35 as Walsh operates with time. And slipping before it got there, Andre Brown. Here's a look at Miami's offensive blocking technique. One of the things you see Bruce there pushing James out and double team. One of the things that Miami does that's so difficult, now let's take a look at O'Neill on Dunbar here. They set very quickly with tight splits and they get their hands out. They're experts at it and they make it work. A big part of Walsh's passing game. And they're not a big front line either. Angling to the left is Shannon Crowell. They seem to have a knack, Kevin, for preventing you from penetrating. But if you look across the Miami front line, they're not that big. They average in the 260s. Mike Sullivan is the biggest at 6'4", 274. There are much bigger offensive linemen than that seeing action around the country. Well, one of the reasons they take tight splits, you know, they could stick together, keep shoulder to shoulder, and because they set so shallow and Walsh is so get good at getting rid of the ball so quickly, that's one of the reasons they only have two sacks this year. They have a great combination of offensive line technique and quarterback. Walsh straight ahead, Andre Brown. 
He's out near the 45 of LSU. Greg Jackson, the lone returning starter in the Tigers secondary on the stop. But Walsh, with that much time, usually finds someone. Well, boy, if ever there was an example of what we were just talking about, how quick they set. Look at the pressure up the middle. These guys right together, the offensive line shoulder to shoulder. There was absolutely no penetration, even though LSU sent a lot of people, and Walsh was able to complete that pass. Side pulled down by Dale Dawkins, but he did not have control as he went out of bounds. He was fumbling with it a bit. There's John O'Neill, number 75. Again, there you are, right in the middle of your screen, doing a tremendous job. He's had four operations, O'Neill, and he's back to play. Had was not healthy the entire year. The beneficiary, of course, of all of this is that man. He gets the publicity. But the offensive line for Miami does a tremendous job in protecting their quarterbacks. And they've had a lot of good quarterbacks and a lot of good offensive linemen. You know, those four operations only on his knees. Had two on the shoulder as well. A lot of time on the table. Shannon Crowell carrying. LSU's defense getting tough here. Eric Hill on the stop. 54, Eric Hill out of Galveston, a high school All-American. LSU will get a couple of good players over here from Texas. How could anybody that wet be that happy? It's Saturday night in Baton Rouge. <laughs> That's right. Some of them don't feel what's going on out here. Well, we ought to ask Chris Fowler how it, how it feels to be wet. I haven't heard from Chris in a while, <laughs> have you? I saw him doing the backstroke in the end zone a little while. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long seven on third down. And great coverage outside on the left. Mike Mays all over Dale Dawkins. <laughs> all, over, all over is the key phrase there. You got it. There comes Dunbar on O'Neill and on Walsh. But we'll see the combination. Walsh will get rid of the ball. He feels the pressure. There's a lot of pressure by LSU there, wasn't there? Pressure from the defensive secondary. Tim Kalau will kick it back deep. Jimmy Young. Kalau's kicked three times, averaging 38. He's looking toward the left corner. Fair catch signal. Fumble, and Miami appears to have it. Inside the 20, a high-risk attempt at a catch by Jimmy Young, and it will cost the Tigers big time. That ball did a straight dive on him, and he still tried to catch it. There's absolutely no reason to try to catch that ball. In the wet like ground, it. all the punts have been dying about three or four yards from where they hit. The question is whether Miami had possession of this ball before they go out. A young should never attempt a catch like that. And this thing is going for the end line. The question is, did he have possession? Handy. Watch number 66. Does he have the ball? when he goes out. Now that ball is on the ground and he has to have control of it. We'll never know. Another mistake in the kicking game. Walsh outside Randy Bethel inside the tent. Jimmy Young and Jamie Bice knock him down but we'll go back to the punt one more time. Ball is loose. I don't think he had control. No, see, I thought I saw both of his hands on the ground, the ball underneath his chest as he slid out of bounds. Yeah, the official standing right there, however. It really doesn't matter now. No, that's two plays ago now. Jimmy Young on the punt return team. He did not want to let the ball bounce and get inside his own 10 yard line. He tried the high risk grab and well, Miami could put this one way ahead now. Right in the right right corner. Right up, and Bobby, you don't catch those in the dry well. Fred Highsmith angling to the seven, maybe the six. Flags fly, and you have to think it's face mask on a play like that when the ball carrier is struggling to stay up and the defenders are trying to wrestle him down. 
Clock stops with 25 seconds left, third quarter. Personal foul, personal foul, face mask. First down. That's inadvertent face mask, of course. Plays over. Here's Hill, 54, 245 pounds. Look at the job he does. Holding off that blocker, that blocker. Pushing it out, getting his hands all over Highsmith, certainly on the face mask. And then defensive coordinator Pete Jenkins with a good look at this. Frustrated, obviously. So the ball has moved down near the three-yard line of LSU. Tigers have called the timeout. 25 seconds remaining, third quarter. Miami on top, 20 to three, about to get more. Well, the Tigers are number one in the SEC. We'll see what they can do against this Miami offense. It's first and goal at the three. Cleveland Gary and Shannon Crowell in the backfield. It is Crowell. Wrestled down. Nice play, Eric Hill. Defensive coordinator Pete Jenkins, who also specializes in handling the defensive line, has to like this one. Well, hell again, up around the head area, has to be careful. Crowell, Crowell's the only architectural major on the team. He just had his roof torn off. <laughs> <laughs> so did Eric. <laughs> so on to the fourth quarter we go. Nice hit by Eric Hill, and here we go. One quarter remaining, Miami 20, Tigers of LSU 3. We'll be right back. Early field position gave Miami scoring opportunities in this game. Later, kicking mistakes kept LSU from scoring more than those three points in the first half. A scoreless third quarter, and here we are with Miami's second and goal at the three. Jimmy Johnson trying to go 8-1. and one. He's only gone 11-0 and the last two regular seasons. Trying to tack on six more here. Cleveland Gary. Looked like he wanted to leap over the line. And LSU reacting like they made a big defensive play, which they did. But it looked like Gary tried to launch off the landing gear and nothing happened. Yeah, all that money for ballet was out the window on that. LSU, again, tremendous defensive team. The score is really not an indication they were put in a bad position here. Miami's not going to run it in on this team. They're down and three. Third and goal. Early fourth quarter. Out of the end zone. Boy, nice catch, but about four yards out with Randall Hill. Isn't this the end of the stadium where LSU has a history of those goal line stands, Kevin? Yeah, Randall was almost sitting up there with the people that, that help him out. Steve Walsh, of course, on the goal line. Watch him check off. This is what Miami quarterbacks do so well. He wants to loft it. You've seen it a million times. Just loft it to the corner of the end zone. Again, a timing pattern, and again, the conditions make this nearly impossible. Throws it on a line, which it's not normally done. And that was a good catch. Looks like there was a flag after that play. Of course, at this range, it doesn't hurt you a whole lot in terms of the field goal attempt. Carlos Huerta will make an appearance. Well, it's still, they're showing third down. It has to be fourth down. I, I, can't, yeah, I can't believe that they would. Oh, it's delay a game penalty before the snap. They get another shot. Uh huh. There's quick penetration, and it's into the end zone. Cleveland Gary. Juan Sancho was pressuring Walls, who dumped it. And Cleveland Gary grabbed it right at the flag. Jamie Bice wrote him out, but he had crossed the plane, and Miami takes a 26-3 lead. Well, the one player that should be covered down here is Cleveland Gary. He's the leading receiver. It's a little bit of a pick on Harmon. And then Bice doesn't get there until the ball crosses the plane. A little, little pick there. But you have to be sure this guy's not in the offense, that you have him covered. And actually, the coverage is not bad, just by a foot. 
So a Miami mistake helps the Hurricanes on the delay of game. No problem for a senior Huerta there as he knocks it right through. And with 51 seconds elapsed in the fourth quarter, Miami all over LSU, 27 to 3. Control. LSU needs a big play in a hurry into the end zone is what the Tigers need to get as Miami has opened up a 24 point lead they've been awesome down deep in LSU territory Wayne Williams will take it out of the end zone storyline Baton Rouge inside the 30 Miami has scored all 27 of its points LSU in four attempts has come away with only a field goal Rushing yards, Miami dominant on the ground, and the Tigers five times have gone to fourth down, only one time. Have they managed to move the chains? A little phone call upstairs. Well, he might be talking about next year's Heisman because he will be the leading candidate. Mickey Guidry again as the quarterback for LSU. Little option right side. And they snuck that one out pretty well. Randy Shannon all over Calvin Windham. It's over in the Big Ten where the Hawkeyes hold on to beat the Gophers. Fresno State dogs keep on barking out west. Northern Arizona over Weber State. That one is in the fourth. And UNR over Idaho State in the third. Here it's 13-30 remaining, fourth quarter. Miami on top of LSU, 27-3. Tony Moss motions to the near side, in the pattern, can't reach it. Donald Ellis watching him. And not much happening for LSU offensively now. They've got Kidry in the game. Tough spot for a kid to come in. I mean, he's been in tough spots before. Let's go out there and get me 28 points, Mick. He got a few in that Alabama game, but he wasn't down by 24. Yeah, on a wet field, too. And, uh, this, is, uh, this is not one of those situations that you'd like to be in if you're a fresh quarterback coming into the game. Miami can tee off on third and 17. And Gidry grounding it. Don't see any flags. Greg Mark and Bill Hawkins from defensive ends with the pressure. And LSU will kick it away. Victor Jones was in the vicinity. That's why they didn't call uh, intentional grounding. The pressure was there. Hawkins, a tremendous player. Haven't heard much from him. Here's Mark, uh, Hawkins, 54. And Mark getting there first, Hawkins second. This is what Miami normally would do. Of course, they know every play is a pass now, so they can really come. Greg Bourgeois from his own three. Nearly blocked, end over end, not much distance near side. Gets a nice kick. It's out to the 44 yard line. A no flags on the play, and Miami again will have it in good field position, leading 27 to 3. ESPN Showdown Saturday, Miami and LSU is being brought to you by the new generation of Oldsmobile. Step into the future now at your Oldsmobile dealer. By Almaden Wines, every glass is sheer pleasure, pure enjoyment. And by Atra Plus, Gillette made it smoother. Things, though, a little rugged for the home team here tonight. LSU giving up early points to Miami, who had great field position, kicking game mistakes, and missed opportunities on fourth and short. Dooming LSU so far, and this is Craig Erickson. Yeah, he's Walsh's backup. You never hear about him. Off the hands of Dale Dawkins, and pretty good coverage downfield by Mike Mays. Craig Erickson, a 6'2 sophomore. He's from Atlantis, Florida. He's thrown the ball 44 times now this year. Pretty good completion rate. Five touchdowns, only one picked off. He's uh, a highly recruited athlete, was out of high school, and in fact, many people feel that athletically he has more gifts than does Steve Walsh. And they call him the best number two in the country, and they're considering, or at least some of the media considers, he should be redshirted next year in Walsh's senior year. 
He would have two years remaining after that. Continuing the tradition of very good quarterbacks at Miami. Daryl Phillips, 62 in on that stop as Alex Johnson, 5'9", sophomore, as the tailback of Miami, sees his first action of the night. Hurricanes will be content to get a couple of first downs here if they can and keep the clock moving. It's down to 12, 20 remaining. Erickson will try to run it. He has to get to the 35, and he is met head-on by Eric Middleton, a freshman linebacker. Jimmy Young at corner helping finishing him off. Erickson says, thanks a lot for bringing me in here. This is, I'll tell you, a backup quarterback. <laughs> if he thinks he puts his head down, he's invisible. Can't get on the ground. Look at this. He says, no, no, that's not the way to do it. You don't put your head down and stop. You got to lay down. You know, maybe we better start thinking about who the third string quarterback <laughs> yeah. is if he continues to run like that. That's like if you see a car coming in the middle of the street, you don't get out of the way. You just duck your head. It's still going to hit you. All right, to the sidelines. Here's Chris Fowler. The okay, Bob, I'm with Jim Higgins, the chairman of the executive committee of the Sugar Bowl. Your committee is going to have a tough decision to make next Friday. If Auburn beats Alabama, you know it's a co-championship, LSU and Auburn. What will you do in that situation? Well, we'll look at the ratings, needless to say, and uh, it always comes into play of uh, who beat whom. So it's going to be a tough decision because we know LSU fight, fight real hard. They're never going to say die. So uh, we're going to have to wait and see. LSU fans will go crazy if you pick Auburn over their team. It seems to me head-to-head -head competition is the logical tiebreaker in a two-way tie. Well, it would be, but if one team is ranked number six and one team is ranked number 16, you kind of have to go with the one that's ranked highest, I would believe. The economic factors come into play, the fact that LSU wouldn't bring as many fans to New Orleans. Really not. LSU would bring a lot of fans. Auburn would bring a lot of fans. We want to just get the best ball game. Okay, we'll figure it out on Friday when Auburn and Alabama play. Back upstairs. If, if it's rankings, Bobby, why do you have a league champion? Yeah, just give the highest rated team the title and why would you even play for a league title if there's nothing to gain? Steve Walsh is the quarterback again and they get the first down on fourth and three as Shannon Crowell runs the ball off the left side down to the 30 yard line. Tomorrow ESPN starts your football Sunday with NFL game day. Chris Berman, Tom Jackson, Pete Axdom and John Saunders preview the day in the league. Then at 7 p.m. they're back to recap the day on NFL prime time. At 8 p.m., the coverage of the NFL continues when the Red Hot New England Patriots take on the Miami Dolphins. Mike Patrick and Joe Theismann for all the action tomorrow night on ESPN. Straight ahead, Alex Johnson inside the 30. Rudy Harmon met him. Let's go back to the Sugar Bowl thing a little bit, Kevin. You know, the thing that Chris was touching on, yeah, LSU makes the Sugar Bowl and their fans come down for the ball game, but they don't come into town like tourists as other teams have, like uh, Auburn's. They don't stay in the hotels as long. They don't buy as many meals and things like that because they live nearby. A lot of people feel, even though it wasn't admitted, that that is a factor. Geographical discrimination are we talking about? <laughs> I feel we did that game. The Auburn, uh, you and I did, Mike and I did that game. The Auburn-LSU game was an emotional win. It was a great win for LSU, and it goes for naught under this system. Alex Johnson, the ball carrier. Coming off the right side, the initial hit made by an LSU Tiger who is shaken up down on the field. It looks like Carl Dunbar, the left defensive end. He went helmet to helmet with Crowell. Straight down to the turf he went. Dunbar has played a tremendous game, as really the LSU defense has played a very fine game. I they think. really have. And here's Dunbar coming in, ducks his head, and takes a pop right on the top of the head. You gotta be careful ducking your head. Can't do that. 10.32 left, injury on the field. Jimmy Johnson's team way out on top. Welcome back to Baton Rouge. There were 79,500 here. A lot of them have gone home. LSU on a rainy night trailing Miami 27 to three. 10 and a half minutes left, it's second and 17. Steve Walsh buries one as he looks for Alex Johnson. Kevin, let's uh, project into the future just a little bit, maybe a week from now. 
Miami number three right now. You have to figure it this time in a week. He'll be number two. Either Notre Dame or USC will lose. But what about West Virginia? Still unbeaten. Will they still be behind Miami in the ratings and going into the New Year's Bowls? That will be a big, big factor for a team that could go 12 and 0 and not win at all. Well, I, I hope nobody from Arkansas is watching this. If Miami beats Arkansas, of course, they will move up to number two. Uh, let's continue after this play. Down the field, Andre Brown at the 15-yard line. Rudy Harmon on the stop. Here's how we look at the top five coming in. Florida State, idol of the top five. One of those two teams, Notre Dame or USC, will drop at least a few notches because they play each other next week. Miami will move up to number two if they beat Arkansas. West Virginia is finished. They will move up to number three. They have to because, as I said, one of those two top teams will lose, and West and Florida State will also move up. It's going to come down, obviously, to Notre Dame if they win against USC. We'll continue in a minute. First down, pass right side, and that one is over on the right for Tracy Waiters. Waiters, a fullback, 5'11", senior out of Bradenton, Florida, and he gets it on the right side. You know, it's interesting. Florida State might not move up. If that's a close game between Notre Dame and USC, the loser maybe could drop down to number four, and the Seminoles might have to stick right where they are. Well, there'll certainly be a battle in a smoke-filled room about that one. The, yeah. the scenario that's probably the ugliest of all scenarios, if Notre Dame beats USC, remains number one, and West Virginia beats them, Miami, if they go undefeated, could get the national championship, as you said, ahead of a 12-0 West Virginia team. And that'll be a nice conversation uh, mm. the day after the ball game. Tracy Waiters on the carry again. And again, Jimmy Johnson makes, uh, we might want to take a look at that, that schedule again, and the fact that Jimmy Johnson played six teams, Miami played six teams in the top 20 this season. And uh, if they go through undefeated, they will have lost only to Notre Dame. And uh, that is his criteria, as you might expect, for picking a <laughs> national champion. Third down and two. Cleveland Gary again trying to launch a jump. We'll check it. It's not 24-43. It's 34. Tracy Waiters. And again, Miami playing the best. No doubt about that. LSU tonight. Arkansas in a week. And then Nebraska in the Orange Bowl. Well, he has a point. And uh, interesting, he, he told us about why he plays this tough schedule. Because they need to get people into the cotton, into the Orange Bowl. If he plays a light schedule, they will not get fans into the Orange Bowl. They averaged almost 50,000 this year, so it's working. But it also makes it very difficult for Miami to get through undefeated. They haven't been undefeated, but they could be very close. And they, in fact, might get the national title over an undefeated West Virginia team if certain things happen. Carlos Huerta, no problem from 22. Miami tacks on three more. 7.49 remaining in the football game. Steve Walsh back in there. His replacement injured 30 to 3. So we're in the last 7.49 of the game, and Miami on top of LSU 30 to 3. Edgar Bennis will kick off again for the Hurricanes of Miami. About to go 8 and 1 on the year. LSU came in seven and two. Their SEC record will end on the year at six and one. They played two lane in a week. And at the five, it is Wayne Williams angling near side, out and over the 30, fighting his way near the 35-yard line, and he is stopped right there. Back in our broadcast position with Kevin Kiley, Bob Carpenter, we continue our deep discussion of who are the best teams in the country and how might the scenarios work out. Kevin, you've seen a bunch of the top five teams on ESPN here this season. Uh, who do you uh, favor as the top team in the country? The only team I have not seen is West Virginia, but I got a chance to watch them a little bit on television today. It's my feeling the winner of the USC Notre Dame game Whichever one of those teams, and West Virginia included in that, wins in the bowl game, that is the number one team. In other words, if USC wins and then wins the Rose Bowl, uh, I believe that they would be the number one team. And I believe that uh, Notre 
Notre Dame if they were to go undefeated throughout. And I think that if West Virginia beats Notre Dame in the Fiesta Bowl, they should be the top team in the country. Who's the best team you've seen? Best team, Notre Dame. I, I really felt that uh, Tony Rice made the difference early in the year. I didn't think that he was a top quarterback. Uh, the second half of the year, he matured. I believe that that team is the best team. Across the board, they are the strongest team in the nation. Fighting Irish finding out what team speed can do for you. They've got more this year than they've had in recent years. Well, that's a big improvement. That was Lou Holtz. He brought him in. He also took a personal hand in Tony Rice, and I think Lou Holtz deserves a lot of credit for that. And he made, uh, he made Tony Rice into a top college quarterback, and the kid's got two years to go. Tommy Hodson, a quarterback for LSU. Tony Moss couldn't hold on a moment ago. It's second and ten. A little flip ahead. This is Alvin Lee. Alvin is out over the 45 as LSU gets it to Lee. Shannon on the stop and back to the studio. Or rather down to the sidelines. Here's Chris Fowler. <laughs> We talked about the home field advantage for LSU and the decibel meter. Well, it's very quiet right now. They're trying to drum up support with the band, but it's, it's getting lonely up here. Miami, a textbook job of playing on the road. They took the Tigers out of it early. The crowd was really never a factor back upstairs. Still clutching his decibel meter, though. I saw that. If I'd have known he was up there, I would have thrown it to Bob Euchre. <laughs> Hodson delivering it right side. Ronnie Halliburton, the tight end. Out over the 45 to the 48. Randy Shannon, a multitude of nicknames. Jack the Ripper is the one he's called because he's always playing pranks around the Miami team. The team. best one I like is the onion because he makes girls cry. Oh. <laughs> King of Zing has to do with his hitting ability. Our man Flint, is, uh, he's the guy that gets around the locker room and some of his pranks are very famous and not able to be spoke. Yeah. They say at the training table, never leave your meal unattended with Shannon around. He doesn't eat it either. Second and five. Hudson. Left side. Moss way out in the open. I mean, there was nobody in a white jersey within 10 yards behind him. If that one's delivered close to Tony, he can catch it, look around, see he's uncovered, and trot to the end zone. The boss has played a brilliant game. Uh, he was a marked man coming in. They wanted to double team him. He's been all over the field, made some tough catches, been battered. He's played extremely well and still finding a way to get open. He's wide open here. Hudson again. Again, the timing is uh, got heavy legged players on soft ground and uh, a wet ball, and you can't expect to complete too many passes. Third and five as the clock stops with 6.06 remaining. Miami on top, 30 to 3. And Alvin Lee was looking downfield to see who was going to tackle him after he caught it. Problem was, he never held on. Hudson was pointing at Calvin Windham to release deep. And Calvin Windham stood there and looked at him. Fifth drop pass for LSU. And again, Hodson's got a tremendous amount of heat this year, but he's not getting the support. And Hodson pumped there. He knows he's not throwing it. Now he's going to buy himself some time. Look, he said, Calvin, go deep. Calvin doesn't move. He throws it to Alvin Lee, who drops the ball. Now, who do you blame for that? You boo Tommy Hodson? No way. And Tony Moss ended up in the area as well. 5.58 remaining. Hurricanes are cruising to their eighth win of the year. Tigers will kick it away in the last six minutes of the game. Brian Griffith, their short kicker, their pooch man, if you will, will let it go from about his own 40. Daryl Spencer back at his own 10 for Miami. He'll dive ahead and go down with the knee at the 22. Be sure to be with the ESPN Thursday for a very special Thanksgiving. 10 Eastern, we showcase a high school rivalry. It dates back to 1905, Eastern High School of Pennsylvania against Phillipsburg High of New Jersey. And then at 8 p.m., a college rivalry classic, the Aggies of A&M and the Longhorns of Texas. Craig Erickson is back in there for Miami, a night of battering. That's the LSU offensive lineman, Ralph Norwood. Not much offensively for the Bayou Bengals here tonight. Ball carrier, Shannon Crowell, Eric Middleton, the freshman out of Corsicana, Texas, on the stop. 
Clock runs with 5.35 remaining. Well, this will be a performance that no matter what happens with LSU playing Tulane next week, will not terribly impress that Sugar Bowl committee. Well, all, all the things that could have happened bad for LSU based on their game plan did happen. It's a very fine team. They're not an offensive powerhouse. They never were this year. Out of bounds, right side on the incompletion. Of course, Mike Archer of LSU, we talked about it earlier, a real background in Miami as a player. He spent 10 years as a player and a coach. There he is with the long locks and the mutton chop sideburns and all those things that went on back in the early 70s. Looks like the bride of Frankenstein. That was Kevin Kiley, coach, if you're watching the replay sometime soon. <laughs> I tell you, what a fine coach. He's made an impact here early. Great season a year ago in his rookie campaign. Here's Shannon Crowell toward the outside, and he did not stay in bounds. Eric Hill on the stop. And really, LSU about to be 7 and 3, playing the likes of Texas AM, shutting them out, winning on the road at Tennessee, Florida, Alabama, and Mississippi State. They lost, of course, at Florida in a close ball game, as they did at Ohio State. But what a win here at home over Auburn and in Kentucky. And we'll play Tulane to wrap things up next week. Tim Palau will kick it away for the Hurricanes. He's kicked it four times, averaging 36. 